Um, so just a few housekeeping uh, items, not ant related. Um, one, uh, thank you very much for the diapers. My um, my daughter is, I think she's like on some sort of like Buddha baby diet or something. She is like within the hundred and like sixtieth percentile for her weight. <laughs> she's very big. She's like we like. She's in a size two, and then uh, my wife's like, what size did I get her? And I was like, well, this is a size three. And she's like, perfect. So we put her in there, and it's like, fits like a glove. And she's, she's also rolling over uh, at like three months, which is kind of uh, nuts. I'm like, slow down, kid. Just slow down. Um, anyway, that was good. Um, thank you for that. Um, the prescriptions looked overall very good. Um, just a few points uh, of clarification. Most of you guys, you guys can see your comments on those that I wrote correct. All right, good. Um, in general, so with the prednisolone, that uh, was pretty good. I didn't see anyone that did any kind of crazy dosing, but look at your concentrations. Make sure you're um, selecting the right one. If you select one that doesn't actually exist and you were to send that to the pharmacy, you'd certainly at least end up in a phone call uh, back to you to try to get clarification for that. Um, and the other thing is that when you're giving drugs to kids, do you want to do more often, less often? Less often, yeah. If you can get away with just one time daily dosing, that's going to be a lot better because, again, trying to um, get medicine to a child, if you have not had a, the opportunity to do so, I would recommend uh, finding a random child to try to get medication to. Um, it's not su super easy, right? Um, so uh, less frequent dosing is going to be better for them in a lot of cases. You may go more frequent depending on severity, uh, depending on uh, the volume you're having to administer. Maybe splitting that up is going to be a little bit better for them. It just depends, but usually less is better in those cases. Um, the albuterol. So there's a little bit of um, a little bit of difference in, in um, depending on the source you were going with, uh, the dosing might have been a little bit different. But some people were writing for, uh, and I can't remember it specifically, but it was like give, uh, you know, two to six puffs or something like every 20 minutes. And then if you get good response, then do every four hours for 24 to 48 hours. That sound familiar to anyone? All right, I think that was from something like up to date, perhaps. Yeah. So. That's good for like the initial sort of uh, acute exacerbation. Now, that's typically kind of what you're doing there in like the ER, or the urgent care clinic, where you're kind of giving them several nebulizations kind of up front. That's a really big dose to try to kind of get them uh, loosened up. And then you can send them home usually on a rescue inhaler. The thing is, those uh, these patients with asthma, uh, you're typically trying to prevent them from coming back into the ER. So if I can go ahead and give them a script, um, but it's only saying, hey, for that first four, 24 to 48 hours, here's what you do, but there's no instructions for thereafter, what happens if they have another asthma attack, right? They don't want to start that whole process over again. They want to go with something that you can do pretty much, you know, kind of continuously. And so that's where typically like a dose, two puffs every four to six hours is needed for wheezing slash cough is a, is a typical uh, prescription there. You may do like two to four, but in, in general, two is pretty good. Um, you don't see a lot of additional benefit by going above two in a lot of cases. Um, you see more side effects, certainly. So, you know, and, and what side effects would you expect to see from a butyrol? Tachycardia. Tremors, those are the big things, kind of some anxiousness associated with it. And you see that a lot more like nebulizations because, again, you're just kind of, um, you know, passively inhaling like, you know, just a ton of drug all at one time. <clears throat> the inhalers, you got to mitigate that because you're giving a much smaller dose, um, but it's much more kind of um, targeted because you're actually, you know, doing this kind of synchronous breathing with that. Um, how can you kind of, what sort of device can you use to try to help and improve the efficacy of an inhaler? Yeah, using like a spacer or like a valve holding chamber, which is good. So some people wrote for that. You can. It, it doesn't really matter. Um, that is something additional that they can purchase. You don't necessarily need a script for that. Um, but that is nice because you can just kind of squeeze the canister. It will go in to fill that chamber, and then the patient can kind of breathe it in as they need it or um, when they're ready for it, essentially. there's uh, You kind of um, mitigate some of that um, synchronicity, I guess, you need um, uh, to, to do that uh, effectively. And, and so who might that be good for? <coughs> Children can be a good one, elderly, so those are, those are the big ones. Um, so that's fine. Uh, typically, um, I would not do less than uh, one puff. I would not do less than two puffs, I should say. With one puff, like you're kind of, that first puff is usually going to be good to kind of help to kind of open up some of the larger uh, bronchioles, but then as you start to loosen that up, you allow for deeper penetration of the second dose. And so that's why usually we like to do two puffs, that way you can open up things to begin with, and then you can get a little bit deeper penetration for that second dose. Does that make sense? That's typically why I see two puffs uh, from that standpoint. One probably may get the job done, but it depends on, on your patient. Uh, so I think those are the biggest things about albuterol. Again, you want something um, that they can kind of do continuously, so that way if they need it, they know what to do, they know what dose to give themselves, so that way they don't end up back in your ER for another uh, asthma exacerbation, right? Because that's the big thing we're trying to prevent. Um, is there anything else with albuterol? Any questions you have on that? Yeah, yes. As far as the, like, period for wheezing and coughing, yeah. 
that and not add more like, because we've never really done that for other prescriptions. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so that's a good uh, clarification. And this kind of goes back to the high set prescription as well that we did for the last one. So if you're writing for something say, for metformin, they're going to take every single day, they're going to take metformin 500 milligrams daily, right? Um, you can say for diabetes control, and that's fine because the patient knows they're taking every single day. They don't need any kind of prompt on when to take it, right? For something that is specifically PRN, like you need to give the patient a reason why they need to take it. So for instance, if you say like, you know, high set for otitis media, well, they don't take high set every time they have an ear infection. They take it when they have pain associated with this surgery they had, right? Um, or in the instance of asthma, if you're having a rescue inhaler, um, just for, you can say asthma attack, but that may be a little bit more more nebulous. But if you can tell the patient, if you're wheezing, if you're coughing, this is a good reason to go ahead and use the inhaler, that, that makes it more clear for them. And so that's why we say, um, that's why you can put a range on the hours. So that way, you know, if they need it every four hours, they can use it, but if they can use it less frequently, then that's fine too, right? Um, so in general, if it's a PRN medication, be more specific as to when you want the patient to actually use that. Does that make sense? Or in some cases like with a lot of opioid prescriptions you'll do something like um, use high set you know q6 hours uh if pain unrelieved by ibuprofen right so that way you can try to limit the amount of opioids you're actually having to take in total because that's always going to be a benefit for your patient like fewer opioids is always going to be better in, in general because of the side effects and whatnot right so and we'll do that sometimes like in the hospital setting we'll do for post-operative orders we'll have like a uh you know standard order set where they'll have several options and they will have pain scales associated with them so that way the nurse has very specific directions they go in and say hey what's your pain on a scale of one out of ten and say hey it's a seven they go okay it's a seven we'll go ahead and give oral oxycodone versus if it was a nine they would give iv morphine right so that way you want to make sure that um, nurses have good directions because again they're not uh for their license they can't do independent um uh, practice or independent prescribing um and so they need specific directions on, on what to give and when to give it right um so this is a big thing it's a very good question thank you uh for that uh, anything else with the albuterol you know it's probably our first inhaled med oh yeah um make sure you put like you know inhale you know two puffs or whatever um po so that way they're not trying to like do it up their nose or something goofy you know because again if they have asthma typically they have like allergy issues as well and they may be prescribing something like flonase along with that um something intranasally used uh and so you want to make sure that they have good instructions on what to use where it may seem very clear to you that yes of course they should you know inhale the puffs by mouth and you're educated them to that However, you know, it's so like you see the signs that says, you know, don't do, do something super obvious. And it's because someone did that thing to, to make them have to make a sign, right? Anyway, um, and then for the Levitra one, that one um, was totally fine. I liked everyone to put the instructions. Hey, take 60 minutes before um, uh, sexual intercourse. I thought that was good. So that way you give the patient very specific instructions on when they're supposed to use it. Um, and again, the insurance thing is going to be uh, uh, the main stopping point there. Um, and so I didn't count off for anyone for, for putting down 30 pills. Um, you know, most patients will not need 30 pills for a month. Time frame. You may have some Casanovas out there that do need it. Um, however, insurance companies are very unlikely to cover that much. Um, actually, I was looking on LexiComp and, and for a, a pack of 30 pills, um, it was like $1,500 still. So it's still pretty expensive. Um, and insurance companies uh, don't want to necessarily cover that. They may only cover, say, three to five pills in a month or whatever time frame that they set, but that's going to be very insurance company dependent. Or the patient's paying cash, may only pay for one or two at a time. So these patients are needing it every single time. Do they, are they coming back to their provider every four or five times? Well, you can you can set refills, right? So you can say, hey, I'm going to go ahead and write for this many refills, um, you know, because again, it's still a, a standard prescription. You could write for a whole year's worth if you wanted. So you could say, hey, I'm going to dispense eight pills, uh, and it's going to be, you know, for eleven refills or something like that, and that would be totally fine, right? Especially if they kind of know what their dose is and, and, and all that. The other thing is that if you write write for thirty, and the insurance company only covers say five. Um, the pharmacy will just go ahead and fill that five and then they'll keep the rest on balance essentially. The patient may never be able to actually fill those because of the cost prohibiting or the, the prohibiting nature of that cost. Um, but they will at least keep it on file and they'll keep a balance essentially. So it would not be wrong, which I didn't count anyone off on that, but it is something the patient would be unlikely to actually fill. You know, so again, it'll, it'll differ on every patient and kind of what drug it is. Some insurance companies will have a preferred agent, so maybe still Denafil is cheaper, and that'll be a preferred agent versus like Levitra. You know, in some cases, you may need to, um, you know, kind of figure that out with your patient. Yes, ma'am. Um, they would fill five per month. So they, if you try to go back and kind of cash in on one of those refills early, they would get a refill too soon uh, error uh, from the insurance company and they would not be able to, they say, okay, well, we can fill this. We can give, because you're entitled to all those pills your provider wrote for. However, you'd have to pay cash for it, right? And most people don't want to necessarily have to pay for that. Um, now, on the other hand, what are some cases where you may, or does anyone know any cases where you might use a, uh, a phosphodesterase inhibitor for, say, non- 
um, uh, erectile dysfunction related uses. Pulmonary hypertension. So if you had someone who you were writing for, say, sildenafil, uh, and, and it has a different branding when it's used for pulmonary hypertension, it's uh, uh, Revatio or, or Revatio, however you want to pronounce that. Um, in those cases, they would actually, uh, you probably have to do like a prior authorization um, and, and go ahead and, and send that off to an insurance company. You'd have to sign something off on a form. And then once they approve that, then it would be okay to get, you know, say, uh, daily use for that sort of medication. So some of it is very disease state specific, uh, but in the case of uh, more of kind of a uh, quote unquote lifestyle sort of uh, disease like right dysfunction, um, it's going to be uh, one of the things where they typically try to cover fewer pills than, than more. Does that make sense? Any other questions on the scripts? This last one should be pretty straightforward um, with the HIV meds. So just, uh, I, I think you guys are pretty expert at uh, writing pediatric uh, oral suspension prescriptions. Everyone did fine on the test from that standpoint, so uh, very good. Um, the test I did give one, uh, there's one answer or one question with two correct answers. I went and gave credit back for that. Um, otherwise, everything else was pretty good on the test. So any questions from that? All right, well, let's go ahead and continue on and getting into our section on toxicology. So um, you will have a section uh, for this in CMS where I get to guest lecture. Uh, so you get to see my ugly mug again for that. Um, we're going to cover a little bit of different things because I don't want to, to necessarily retread the same ground um, from that standpoint. However, um, just a little bit of background. So as you might know, I did my fellowship, uh, two-year fellowship in clinical toxicology. <laughs> Typically, there's kind of two routes for people to go if they want to pursue toxicology. Usually, if you're a physician um, and you specialize in something like emergency medicine, pediatrics, or like occupational health, you can then do a fellowship in medical toxicology. So if you're a medical toxicologist, you're talking about a physician. If you are, say, like a non-MD and you are, say, like a nurse practitioner, PA, uh, PhD, PharmD, uh, we can go this other route where we become a clinical toxicologist and there's a, a governing board um, that provides that certification there. So if you see D-A-B-A-T after my name, that's where it means Diplomat of the American Board of Applied Toxicology. That, that's what that is, essentially. Basically meaning I'm a clinical toxicologist. I still take call for the Poison Center. Actually, I just had a, a coral snake call uh, just the other night uh, when I was on call for them. But anyway, um, so the question is, if you deal with a patient who has a potential potentially toxic exposure, what do you do? Hmm? Call me? Where, where would you reach me at? Say you don't have my cell phone number. I say I changed it. I was like, I don't These students keep calling me. Hmm? A poison center. Absolutely. Call the poison. Anyone know the number for the poison center? Everyone should know this. You should have it in your phone in case you ever run into it. You know, either a nephew or a niece or a random person asks you a question about it. You can call 1-800-222-1222. I'm sure all the parents actually had this number memorized. It's very easy to memorize because, again, it's something when you're freaking out because your kid just ate, you know, stuck a, a you know, a nickel up his nose. Um, you want to be able to, to respond to that and figure out what the heck do I need to do with this, right? Um, and so always a couple poison centers. It's always free, which is nice. Uh, we're also like kind of funded through the Department of Health, and it's really good from an epidemiologic standpoint. So we can do things like track new cases of things that are popping up that may be of, uh, uh, you know, clinical importance. You know, if we have new um, designer drugs that are starting to come about and they're sending a bunch of people to the ER, we can start to kind of locally or geographically track those sort of things and, and potentially warn other individuals about certain things that are coming about. Uh, you know, so when the bath salts became a big deal, right? So again, we had the synthetic uh, uh, marijuana strain for a while there, and then it switched over to bath salts, and we were able to kind of track those kind of early on and kind of give a warning to people, say, hey, we're seeing these things, we're seeing these kind of um, signs and symptoms associated with these drugs, here's what to look out for, and here's how to treat it, right? And there's three poison centers uh, in Florida, and again, it's all based on your zip code. So if you have an out-of-state zip code and you call that number, you'll actually probably get whatever your home state um, uh, poison center is, but they can reroute you to Florida. We have one in Jacksonville. Anyone know what the other two are? Uh, Tampa, and then there's Miami, and so we kind of div divvy up the state. If you call from here, uh, a landline here, you actually get the, the Tampa Center. But anyway, so I take call for the Jacksonville Center still. Um, but yeah, so basically if you're talking to someone there, typically you're talking to a specialist in poison information, who is, we call them a spy, because no one wants to be a poison information specialist. So that turns into a, yeah. So anyway, so I want to call them uh, that. Uh, so they're called spies. So if you hear me talking about spies, that's usually what I'm talking about. I'm not I'm colluding with Russia or any, anything like that. Um, <laughs> But usually they're nurses. A lot of them are um, kind of later in their career nurses where the, you know, being on the busy ER floor in the ICU, it's kind of tough, you know, so we have a lot of uh, people kind of close to retirement, but they have a ton of ER experience, ICU nurses, things like that, uh, are typically going to be manning uh, the, the poison centers there. And that's kind of your first point of contact, and they can take you through like 99% of the cases out there. However, if you need backup, there's always a toxicologist who's on call. Uh, so for instance, I do that three nights a month. Um, sometimes it'll be a physician. It just depends on, on kind of what the schedule is and who you talk to. 
but they can give you uh, all the information you need on how to manage your patient from, you know, does this patient need a certain therapy? Do they need to go to the ICU? Do they need to go home? You know, all these different things we can help them manage that. So what I want to give you guys is kind of the, uh, the kind of high altitude sort of view on this sort of thing. What do you do with the initial management? How can you look at a patient and kind of get an idea for what they may or may not have been exposed to based on signs and symptoms, based on uh, their presentation, based on their history? And so we'll go over some of the kind of basics there, and then we'll kind of cover some more specific substances um, here. And then also in the CMS uh, section, we'll cover uh, substances there as well. So I try not to have too much bleed over. It might be a little bit, but just kind of bear with me there, okay? Uh, toxidromes. Anyone know what a toxidrome is? We've already talked about toxidromes here in this class, if you might not know it. So it's a toxic syndrome. Basically, it's a combination of those two words there. We're basically things that are common signs and symptoms that patients will show up with when they've been exposed to a specific substance. So for instance, if someone uh, took a whole bunch of heroin or say oxycodone or something like that, how would you expect them to present to, say, your ER? What would their mental status be? They'd be very lethargic or potentially uptundid, perhaps comatose, right? What about their pupils? You might expect to see meiosis, or we'll cover these again in more detail. But um, so th those are things, if you see saw someone like that, you say, okay, well, that looks like an opioid, right? Um, and that will give you an idea of like, how can I manage this patient? What do I need to do for them? What do I need to treat them with? We have toxidromes for several kind of um, big sort of uh, categories of substances that we'll talk about in more detail here. But this is very useful because it kind of helps me when I look at a patient or I'm hearing about a patient over the phone to get an idea for, okay, well, it sounds like it could be this. Uh, but it also could be this based on these sort of um, different uh, signs and symptoms are presenting with based on their vital signs, based on these different lab tests and things like that, um, which is important because, again, when you have someone who's trying to harm themselves intentionally, how can you tell if they're lying? Their lips are moving typically, right? So, again, you kind of assume uh, people are being uh, very... Uh, 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 not very honest with you in a lot of cases. Either they're worried about, say, legal ramifications, they are embarrassed about what they did, um, they're still actively trying to harm themselves, and by giving you false information, they're able to further that goal potentially. There's lots of reasons why they're not going to give you good information. The other thing is someone who's obtunded from an opioid overdose, how much info can they give you in the first place? <coughs> Not a lot, right? And depending on who they were around at the time, which may be no one, uh, you, information may be pretty hard to come by, right? So it's one of those things where um, by looking at the patient and kind of getting a good idea based on, on you know, these different components we're going to talk about, you get an idea for what they could have been exposed to, right? Now, uh, if you ever hear the term toxin, that's really referring to something that's kind of a natural sort of substance. So something like Botox or botul uh, botulinum toxin is considered a toxin because it's a natural sort of substance that's produced there. Um, snake venom would also be considered a toxin. Uh, if you ever hear me talk about a toxicant, that is basically any kind of uh, synthetic, so any kind of medication, technically a toxicant. However, um, you know, you'll hear the, the name used pretty uh, interchangeably in a lot of cases. And of course, you know, um, can anything be a poison? Absolutely, yes. I'm asking the question, so obviously, yes, I think so. Um, it all depends on what? The dose, right? So again, uh, anything can be a poison. It all depends on the dose. Um, so for instance, does anyone remember, and you guys are, again, are starting to age me out a little bit, um, but uh, when the Nintendo Wii first came out, if you're at least familiar with the Wii, right? You may have been tiny tots playing with your Wii nunchucks. Um, however, there was a radio contest. It was called Hold Your Wii for a Wii. And so basically they had these people, uh, as back when it was very hard to find the weeds at the time, uh, they, they drank a ton of water and they saw who could hold their ear in the longest uh, before, uh, you know, whoever hold it, held it the longest would get a free Nintendo Wii, right? Um, so what do you think happened for those patients? What do you think all that water uh, does to your, uh, say, serum sodium concentration? They die, right, because they get very hyponatremic. So one lady ended up developing hyponatremic seizures uh, and actually died uh, from that. So, again, it's one of those things where anything, even water, even oxygen, can be very dangerous in high concentrations. And so it's uh, important to kind of keep that in mind. Um, some things have a very wide uh, therapeutic index where I can take, you know, several hundred times of a dose of something and not have a problem. Some things where, you know, even double or triple a dose can be very, very dangerous, right? So think back to those therapeutic indexes we, we talked about before. So some of the toxidromes we're going to cover here specifically, and a lot of these we've already talked about in regards to the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. So some of those will look very similar to you. Um, a lot of the mnemonics we're going to use to remember what fits into a toxidrome, um, you're already familiar with. And I made sure to hammer that into you over time to make sure you guys would kind of know this stuff pretty pretty well. Um, so we'll talk about cholinergic, anticholinergic. We'll talk about sedative hypnotics and opioids, sympathomimetics, and then also withdrawal syndrome. This is another important thing because a lot of withdrawal syndromes can actually look like some of these other toxidromes. So we'll mention those we get to them.
So cholinergic poisoning. So basically, the most common place you're going to run into this is when you have something that's going to be inhibiting acetylcholinesterase, right? Because acetylcholinesterase normally does what? Yeah, it breaks down acetylcholine. So if I inhibit that, what's going to happen to my acetylcholine levels? It's going to increase, right? And so that's going to cause way too much activation of both muscarinic and also nicotinic receptors as well. Remember, those are our two main categories of uh, acetylcholine receptors. The more common thing you're going to run into, um, or the thing that is kind of classically described as causing a cholinergic toxicity is going to be these organophosphates. Does anyone know what these organophosphates were used for? Yeah, usually they were used as insecticides. They're very, very cheap and effective insecticides, but very, very toxic. The other thing is these are very uh, lipophilic, so there's a uh, possibility for toxicity even from skin contact with things like parathion, malathion. Um, you don't see them used a lot over here nowadays because we have, um, you know, they may be a little bit more expensive, but they have a lot better safety profile, and we can use these, uh, you know, things like um, pyrethrins and, and things like that. There's not a ton of use of uh, organophosphates, at least in the home. You may see that used in more industrial cases, but in the home, you typically don't find them. However, However, in more developing countries, you're certainly going to find a lot more exposure to these organophosphates, a lot of uh, overdoses associated with these, especially, you know, a farmer has a bad crop one year, lose all their money, and they say, well, I guess this is the end for me, and so they take a bunch of organophosphates. It can be very, very dangerous. Um, what you may be more likely to run into from a clinical standpoint, especially if you ever work in surgery or like anesthesia, you're going to run into some carbamates, and so these are going to be things like physostigmine, neostigmine. These are going to be kind of temporary uh, inhibitors of acetylcholinesterase and can uh, be useful in some cases. So if you think back to our paralytics, you remember how things like rocuronium and becuronium, how do those work to cause paralysis? They block the acetylcholine receptors, specifically those nicotinic receptors, right? So, um, and when you're having someone who undergo surgery, typically you're putting them on a paralytic during that uh, period of surgery. And in some cases, they want to wake them up a little bit sooner, right? They want to wake them up, uh, get done with the surgery. They want to ha help them recover. In some cases, what they can actually do is try to modify the amount of acetylcholine available to kick that paralytic off the receptor. And they can do that with something that, uh, you know, kind of temporarily inhibits acetylcholinesterase, right? So they can kind of temporarily bump those uh, levels up and kind of have the patient kind of um, uh, go back to normal muscular function a little bit sooner. So these are these are two you might see uh, potentially, especially in the surgery slash anesthesia realm, um, but just know that these are going to be uh, similar and causing a cholinergic poisoning if you get too much of it. Now other things, give me more specific things like nicotine. So again, where do you find most nicotine? Cigarettes, right? You can also find them in um, very concentrated forms, especially for um, uh, for e-cigarettes and other vaping devices, like the, the nicotine they have and that stuff. Super, super concentrated. Very dangerous if, they, if a kid gets into that. Um, but again, nicotine would specifically work on which receptors? The nicotinic receptors. Absolutely. Good job. Um, and then the other big group here, which again could be a, more of a concern depending on um, kind of what realm you're working in, but um, these nerve gases, so things like sarin, sobin, and tabin, they are actually very fast-acting acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Um, they're using in more of a chemical warfare sort of situation. Um, does anyone remember The Rock, the movie? Not, not, not the actor, the, the movie, right, with Nicolas Cage and uh, Sean Connery? Right. Anyone remember VX nerve gas? Remember that first scene where the guy drops a little bead and then it breaks open and the guy's face melts off? Not actually true, and I was very disappointed to find out that VX nerve gas, which is a cholinergic acting drug, does not melt your face off, unfortunately. It causes lots of other nasty stuff, but doesn't melt your face off. So again, don't believe the movies always, but that would also fall in this category of kind of nerve agents. What's happening here is that typically you're going to have, say, acetylcholine. Uh, normally, acetylcholine esterase will come along and will allow it to kind of cleave. Uh, acetylcholine into you know these two uh, components here, choline and acetic acid, and they can be recycled again in the uh, nicotinic nerve, uh, where it can then regenerate new acetylcholine for normal use. When you have something like an organophosphate, so here you'd have acetylcholinesterase, you'll actually have the organophosphate come along and bind to it. And this is fine if it was a temporary sort of thing, but what happens here, there's a process called aging where it basically will cause a covalent bond to form. And then at that point, the acetylcholinesterase is going to be done. You cannot interact with acetylcholine anymore. You're permanently stuck not um, uh, metabolizing acetylcholine, right? Until you generate new acetylcholinesterase. It takes time to do that. Um, and so this is why it can be so dangerous for some of those nerve agents because that aging process is very, very quick. Slower for things like organophosphates, but very, very quick for, for nerve agents, which is why they're so bad. Um, you know, it can depend on the agent you're talking about. Some of them are going to be uh, minutes, some of them are going to be hours. Um, the other thing, though, to note is if you're using like something like neostigmine or physostigmine, like in the surgery realm, those are going to be reversible. So you don't have to worry about that kind of covalent process uh, happening there. It's going to be something that will go away with time. The things to, to note here, and again, the old way of knowing that the muscarinic effects you can see with these drugs would be sludge. So anyone has ever heard of the sludge mnemonic? We don't really use that anymore because it doesn't include what we call the killer bees. So what um, mnemonic do I use nowadays?
yeah, the dumbbells, right? So this is kind of the new way we, we do that. Um, slide wants to advance. There we go. The modern way to do it is going to be with the dumbbells, right? So we're going to have defecation. And again, this makes sense because if you have too much muscarinic activity, you're going to be basically secreting stuff from every single orifice possible. So we're going to have defecation. If urination, we're going to have meiosis, right? So typically, based on the uh, muscarinic activity, you're going to see meiosis, bradycardia, bronchorrhea, and bronchospasm. These are the three things that are really going to potentially kill your patient, right? Because again, we have all that secretions into the lungs. What does that do to oxygenation? going to decrease it, right? It's going to inhibit that ability to do that. So that's going to be the, one of the big problems you see with that. A lot of emesis, lacrimation, and then salivation, right? And again, some of the questions I might put on the test would be like, hey, a patient uh, was exposed to an unknown substance, and they come in and they present with these symptoms. It'll be pretty, pretty clear cut. Um, which toxiderm do you think this is, right? Because that would be important to try to recognize these so you know what specific medications to give to it, potentially reverse it. Anyone know what I can give to reverse these effects? Hmm? Yeah, we're going to see atropine is actually going to be one of the big drugs we're going to use there as an anti-muscarinic. We'll talk about that in a second. So there's also going to be the nicotinic effects you have to worry about as well. A lot of people don't think about these, but I use the days of the week uh, to remind me of what the, the nicotinic effects of a cholinergic acting agent is going to be. And again, sp uh, depending on the substance, you may find that you only have one or the other. So for instance, if I have just a nicotine exposure, say a kid gets into um, dad's you know, e-cigarette fluid or the refill and drinks a whole bunch of that, you'd only expect to see the nicotinic effects here. You wouldn't expect to see any muscarinic effects. Mm -hmm. And so the way I rem uh, remember this is going to be my dryasis. So again, typically nicotine can be very stimulatory in in general. You're going to see my dryasis. You're going to see tachycardia, right? So that's going to be our Tuesday. You're going to have weakness as Wednesday. And, and you're, if you remember back to succinylcholine being a depolarizing neuromuscular blocker, how did that cause paralysis? Yeah, it, it, yeah, so eventually it activated or uh, initially activated the nicotinic receptor and then it wore it out, right? Same thing happens with nicotine here. You can actually have a paralysis that develops. Initially, they're going to have fasciculations, which is actually our Friday, right? So fasciculations there because you're having initial activation of those nicotinic receptors, but eventually they wear out and then you're going to get weakness. And then if, potentially, this is the, one of the big problems, they get diaphragmatic failure. They get that paralysis that happens at the diaphragm. And guess what happens at that point? You can't breathe anymore. So if you imagine both of these on top of one another, imagine having that diaphragmatic weakness and then on top of having a bunch of fluid in your lungs, you see why oh, it can be pretty dangerous, right? So again, in early intubation is really important for these patients. Um, the, the Thursday, I, I call it HERS day uh, to try to make the mnemonic fit, but it's hypertension, right? So that would be the other thing you can see there. So if you had a patient who is very early on, you typically see a lot of these nicotinic effects, hypertension, um, hydriasis, and then eventually they kind of bleed over into the more muscarinic effects. Because again, some of these are going to be at odds with one another, right? Because again, we mentioned that usually with the muscarinic effects, what do you see from the heart rate? It's your bradycardia, right? So again, some of these are going to be at odds with one another. It just depends on kind of when they present and what the substance was specifically. Also, a lot of CNS effects you can see with this. Certainly, you can see some you know, confusion, ataxia, um, but it can progress potentially even into um, hallucinations. You can see uh, seizures associated with this. Again, so that's one of the other big things you, you need to um, make sure to watch for. It's going to be seizures. We'll talk about um, uh, that a little bit later in, in just a minute here. So how do we treat these patients? Uh, one, ABCs are going to be really important to so make sure airway support is going to be one of the first things you're kind of addressing with them. You know, they sound like they have super junky sounding lungs. Um, we'll talk about the medication you can use for that. But if they have any kind of weakness going on there, you want to intubate early because that diaphragmatic failure is, is of concern. Um, a lot of the substances like organophosphates come in a hydrocarbon base. When we say hydrocarbon, what does that mean to you? Kind of like an oily sort of like um, almost like a gasoline sort of like kind of base there. That's not very good in the lungs. It does not do good things to surfactant in the lungs. So it can be another thing if they aspirate it and cause a lot of lung damage in kind of the long run there. So you have to watch out for that. Um, and decontamination is going to be super important. We'll talk about decon a little bit later on. Um, but again, anytime you're dealing with lipid soluble substances, you need to make sure you use soap and water, right? Water alone is not going to be enough to get rid of some of these substances. You need to use that soap. And if you imagine, um, let's say you're cooking and you're using some like olive oil, um, and you get all of your fingers. You know, if you just run underwater, do your fingers get, kind of get back to baseline? No, you need to use something like soap and water to try to get rid of that extra oil. So the same thing goes here, where you need to use soap and water to get rid of that stuff. And then as far as antidotal therapy, we're gonna have atropine, which atropine does what? It's gonna block muscarinic receptors. 
which is going to be really good for those dumbbells, right? So again, it's going to help them if they're having a ton of secretions, if they're having their junks, uh, the lungs sound really junky, you can help to dry that out uh, to a large degree, right? So if the switches are really bradycardic, they're having a lot of defecation, urination, all that good stuff, you can dry them out, try to speed the heart rate back up by using atropines. That's always going to be a good drug to use for that. There's also another drug called Tupam or Pralidoxine. This is going to be good to help uh, prevent that aging process to occur. So for instance, if you had an organophosphate exposure, you can give this and it helps to kind of re uh, reset that acetylcholine esterase and so they can actually start to function again so this is something you may see being used uh, there um, and actually if you ever uh, anyone uh, with military experience you've ever heard of a mark II kit yeah, so Mark II kit is actually something they would give to, especially um, a soldier who would be going over, like in the Middle East, where nerve gas attacks were a potential concern. And it was actually a combination of these two drugs. It would actually have atropine and pralidoxine. So that way, if they ever did suspect that they had a chemical attack, they can go ahead and they had these. Um, and again, combat gear is you know pretty tough, pretty tough fiber, uh, you know, kind of a, a material. That, so they had these big giant IM needles, and they would basically just say they thought they had an attack. They would take these things out, and it was like an auto injector, like you would see with an EpiPen. They just kind of jab themselves and, and administer those doses, and they would be good to go from. From that standpoint, or at least kind of give them a little bit more time. Now, the other thing with uh, toxin-induced seizures, uh, and again, you know, you think seizures, like you think someone's coming in for a seizure, what, what's the first drug you go to in a lot of cases? Yeah, benzos are going to be our, our go-to drugs, right? So again, lorazepam is always going to be a good option. Now, if you say benzos weren't working, what would you might go to? Hmm? Yeah, so a lot of people think phenytone, right? So you think normal seizures, yes, you think, you know, benzos aren't working, let me go to phenytone, that works great. And remember how phenytone works? Blocks sodium channels, yeah, blocks sodium channels. Um, phenytoin has no role in treating drug-induced seizures, right? Um, for whatever reason, it just not worked very well. A lot of these drugs are actually inhibiting GABA in a lot of cases, which is why benzos are so effective. Um, do not use phenytoin for drug-induced seizures. We use benzos. If that's not working, we use something like barbiturates, which include what? Phenobarbital, pentobarbital, cecobarbital, any kind of with a barbital on it, that's going to be something that's going to be good there. Because again, these are directly enhancing GABA activity. And then also we could potentially use propofol. Remember where we saw propofol? Yeah, we should use it for the sedation uh, for potential RSI. This is really good because it helps, uh, has a good anti-seizure activity as well. So it's really a, a good backup if you need to do that. Especially because if you're intubating a patient, you have to think about sedation anyway, because again, you want them to be synchronous with the vent. Um, so propofol is a really good drug for that as well. So again, remember any uh, problems with propofol? I, yeah, hypotension. Green urine is not really an issue. If they have green urine, whatever. But um, hypotension is another big thing. So you have to worry about that if they're already hypotensive to begin with. Right? Good. So those are the main ways of treatment. So again, if I said, hey, you know, the patient who's coming in, they had an unknown exposure, they're working on a farm, um, and they come in and they're having, you know, their, uh, you know, incontinent of stool and urine, um, they're drooling uh, at the mouth, their pupils are meiotic, their heart rates, you know, in the 40s, uh, what are going to be my drugs of choice here? And you'd have to come up with, you know, say, what? Atropine and? A pralidoxine or two pam, right? So those are going to be the two drugs you'd use in those cases. If you thought, if you had a high suspicion, it's going to be an organophosphate. Now, again, there's not a ton of antidotes we're going to be memorizing here because, again, for the vast majority of substances, do we have an antidote for them? No, really, tincture of time is the best medicine we can give for a lot of these substances. Um, so again, you have to give the time, liver time to metabolize all of these things off. However, where we do have antidotes, it's good to know when, when and where to use them. All right. So again, atropine really just used uh, kind of on an as-needed basis uh, for mainly the pulmonary secretions. Just become just because they get tachycardic does not mean you cannot give more atropine. Really want the lungs to sound nice and clear, so that way you know they're oxygenating appropriately. That's the big thing to shoot for with atropine. And then mentioned the pralidoxine. Um, don't memorize the dosing necessarily. Just know what those drugs are being used for. Would know what their purpose is uh, when treating with some of these patients. And again, know what substances they're going to be going with as well. Right. Okay. So on the flip side, and again, clinically, you don't see a ton of cholinergic poisoning necessarily. However, what you do see a ton of is going to be anticholinergic poisoning. So if you had to imagine, so we saw, you know, the dumbbells as being the, the toxidrome for uh, a cholinergic poisoning. What would you imagine the opposite of that being for someone who had an anticholinergic poisoning? Remember the mnemonic? Mad as a hatter, so you're going to have some alter mental status. Dry as a beet, or dry as a bone, should I say? I guess beets are kind of liquidy, I guess. Red as a beet. Going to be tachycardic. Hot as a hair. Hot as a match. Hot as a Hades, whatever. Yeah, urinary retention you're certainly going to see. What's the other one? Yeah, blind as a bat, right? So they're going to be very mid-dryatic, kind of impaired accommodation, right? So good, good to remember that mnemonic because it's going to be specific for anticholinergics. Um, and again, what type of uh, drugs do we see causing anticholinergic sort of effects? TCAs, yep, absolutely. 
a lot of first generation antihistamines, a lot of our psych meds, so specifically um, our typical antipsychotics and even some of our atypical antipsychotics will certainly cause a decent amount of anticholinergic activity, right? And again, this is mediated, do you think it's mediated through nicotinic or muscarinic effects? This is all muscarinic, right? So again, this is going to be uh, solely uh, related to anti-muscarinic sort of effects here, right? Because again, if we were blocking nicotinic effects, what would you expect to see? Paralysis, right? It's just like you see with rock and vacuronin. So again, this is specifically just with muscarinic effects here. Good. So th these are the main things. We see a lot of patients who will abuse these, especially because a lot of them are available over the counter. Because again, that mad as a hatter uh, is going to be kind of on a spectrum, right? So again, think about if you take Benadryl, what happens usually to your mental status? You get a little sleepy, right? If you take a lot of Benadryl, what happens? You think you think a lot of sedation, that's not actually the case. What actually ends up happening, you start getting hallucinations, you kind of get a high off of it, and then eventually you can end up developing um, uh, pretty severe agitation, uh, anxiety, seizures can be the big thing that we worry about in those cases. Um, so for instance, if you ever see like, uh, anyone ever heard of triple C's? Coracetin, cough and cold. Um, so basically, it's a popular over-the-counter um, cough and cold preparation that contains chlorpheniramine, which is a first-generation antihistamine um, that people, especially children, right, uh, adolescents, because they have more time than they have since, uh, and they will uh, take a whole bunch of these in order to try to get high. So I remember I had one, one child that came in. He was um, probably like 14 or 15, um, didn't really know what he was doing, uh, and got way too big a dose of this uh, course eating cough and cold, and, and did not develop seizures, but he was super, super close to it. And I think, you know, a typical dose of Ativan for a seizure would be how many milligrams? Anyone know? Two milligrams, right? Two milligrams of Ativan is enough to usually, um, you know, you know, deal with anxiolysis and in order to stop a seizure. It's a pretty good dose. This kid needed 14 milligrams just to get to a point where he would fall asleep, but he's still twitching and having all these fasciculations and things. Um, so very, very nasty stuff if you get too much of it. So be very careful with these. Again, drugs are bad. Um, don't do them more than you should. Anywho, but a lot of plants can do this as well. And so again, things that we have here uh, in Florida, things like jimson weed, angel's trumpet is a popular one. So again, I don't know anyone who has their grandma growing uh, angel's trumpet in their backyard. You know, uh, it's quite a few. So it's a good ornamental plant. You know, it's very pretty, but also can be brewed into teas and used in salads and things like that. So people will get into plants uh, more frequently than you might think. So anyway, lots of things that can cause this anticholinergic poisoning. So as you mentioned, um, they're blocking those muscarinic receptors. Uh, so specifically, these are anti-muscarinic effects we're going to see. Oxidrome's already that red as a beet, so they're going to have that flushing. Um, typically, what does their temperature normally do? They're going to get hyperthermic, right? They're going to be hot as, as, hot as uh, Hades, right? So they're going to be very hot. They're going to be very flush. You expect to see that. They're going to be very dry, so typically dry mouth. Um, urinary retention in a lot of cases. So again, if I was giving you a little clinical vignette, say, hey, patient comes in, they're very tachycardic, uh, you know, they were at a party, uh, they are, um, you know, uh, you know, complaining of dry mouth, pupils are, you know, uh, very midriatic. Those are all things that kind of clue you into, hey, sounds like it could be anticholinergic. Now, this will look very similar to something else we'll talk about in a minute here, but just kind of keep these in mind as we go through this. We'll talk about some differences uh, with some of the other ones in a minute. Right, so these are big things you're, you're going to know with anticholinergic poisoning. So I mentioned uh, usually a lot of tachycardia, maybe some mild hypotension, but mostly tachycardia is a big thing you're going to see there. The other big thing you have to worry about is going to be this de uh, decreased bowel motility, because usually if you think parasympathetic nervous system, what does that do to your guts? Usually increases uh, peristalsis, increases activity. Here with an anticholinergic, you're actually going to have um, decreased bowel sounds is going to be one of the big things you're going to notice with that. And so that can be a problem. If you imagine, if you have a bunch of drugs that's just sitting there not moving anywhere because you decrease bowel activity, uh, bowel motility, um, what do you think that can cause? Well, eventually the guts are going to wake back up and then they can have delayed absorption. So you think they look better, the guts start to wake up, they'll start to absorb it later on, and then all of a sudden they get sick again, right? So it's one of those things you have to worry about. Uh, we'll talk about, you know, um, things we can do about that a little bit later on. And then seizure being the biggest thing uh, we're going to see, and these can be very difficult to treat seizures. Um, like I said, you know, tons and tons of Ativan can be thrown at a patient and they're, you know, still seizing away. So it can be very dangerous from that standpoint. All right. So looking at your differential, this is where a lot of um, our, our kind of our toxin knowledge comes into play here. Because when you have a patient showing up and they present with these kind of nonspecific signs and symptoms, it's your job to try to kind of figure out, say, well, it could be this or it could be this. And that's when kind of the history can be useful. But a lot of times you don't have good history. So some other things that this could look like. So when we talk about sympathomimetics, anyone know what the, that means or that's referring to? Obviously, things that mimic the sympathetic nervous system right so again what do you think could mimic the sympathetic nervous system you know, ramping up that fight or flight response stimulants right so stimulants such as cocaine 
amphetamines, right? So your Adderall, you know, so, um, you know, lots of different things. We'll talk about more specific substances in a little bit, but yeah, like amphetamines, cocaine, um, pseudoephedrine, caffeine, even in some cases can look like this in pathomimetics. So and then they can look very similar to these anticholinergics. So again, looking at the history, looking at, you know, different uh, features, you can try to delineate which one is going to be. So that's one of the big differentials you have to uh, consider. Um, a lot of withdrawal syndromes, which we'll talk about a little bit later, can look like this. And then you guys remember where we saw neuroleptic malignant syndrome? Yeah, antipsychotic, specifically which ones? First yeah, how a first generation, very high, specific, high, um, high potency D2 blocker. So Haldol is one of the big ones. Uh, Flufenazine is the other big one. Any of them could do it, but again, <laughs> Haldol is the biggest uh, offender there. And again, remember how they showed up. Like they have that lead pipe rigidity. They get very hot, very hyperthermic. They get very uh, tachycardic, ultramental status. Again, it looks a little similar to the anticholinergics. And see how they can have some bleed over there. They can what gives you serotonin syndrome? SSRIs, SNRIs, TCAs, and again, we mentioned TCAs also have what activity? Antimuscarinic, right? So again, there's a little bit of bleed over here with some of these things. You can start to see how there's a little, some shades of gray. Um, salicylate poisoning, which would be due to? Aspirin. We'll probably talk about that more in C, uh, CMS. Um, you know, sepsis could even look at this. And again, uh, one of the things we, we make sure that people uh, are keeping in mind, especially when we're consulting over the phone, is don't rule out the medical stuff. Even though you may have a strong suspicion that's drug related, you don't want to rule out any kind of medical stuff that maybe the drugs may have uncovered or it could be contributing here. So certainly if they have uh, sepsis, um, any kind of adrenergic access, and so maybe they have pheochromocytoma, things like this can potentially mimic what uh, some of these toxidromes look like. So again, I always say, yeah, it could be this, but however, make sure you're looking up and rule out the medical stuff as well. Okay, so treatment for these patients, we'll talk about de uh, decontamination later, but ABCs always are going to be the first thing here. Uh, the mainstay for these patients is really just good supportive care. So you want to kind of calm them down, get them in a nice, cool environment if you can. However, they're usually presenting to the ER, and how quiet, calm, and cool is the ER environment typically? Especially if it's like a Friday night, coming in after a party everyone else is there after their parties as well. It's not super uh, conducive to trying to calm patients down. So oftentimes we're going to have to resort to chemical uh, means. And so for agitation and seizures, definitely recommend benzodiazepines. We'll use Versed, we'll use uh, Ativan. Any of those would be fine uh, for treating these patients. And then typically they're tachycardic. Give them some fluids, try to tank them back up. Um, and, and then benzos can also help with this a little bit. We'll talk about the antidote, physostigmine. So we've never heard of physostigmine before. It's an older drug we don't use too, too frequently, mainly due to some of the, the problems we see with it. Um, basically, physostigmine is a, is a uh, reversible acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, right? So just like we saw with the cholinergic <laughs> poisonings, what do we give to fix that? Well, uh, neosigmine is one of those that could cause a cholinergic poisoning, but we could give what to block the effects of that? We give an antimuscarinic, right? We give atropine, right, to, to block that. So again, you're kind of doing the seesaw sort of effect here, where if I have too little acetylcholine activity, I want to give something to kind of help to reestablish that. So if I give an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, um, this will help to kind of get things back in balance. So physostigmine is a drug we can use to do that. It'll temporarily block acetylcholinesterase, increase levels, and hopefully kick whatever the anticholinergic is off the receptor there. And so um, it's good because this can stimulate all sorts of muscarinic receptors uh, in addition to all the other uh, acetylcholine receptors that are out there. And typically this is good if we have patients who are having like refractory seizures, they're not responding to um, benzos. You know, if we give them a ton of benzos, give them propofol, they're still seizing. This is where we might use physostigmine to kind of help get them back in, in order. Now, a lot of people uh, um, don't use this anymore. So if you ever talked to like an ER doc or someone, you know, especially an older school uh, sort of practitioner, they don't like to use this anymore due to the fact that they used to use it a lot for TCA injections. And again, back before we had SSRI, is what was the mainstay of therapy for depression? TCAs, right? We mentioned uh, when you first initially start to take an antidepressant, what's one of the risks? Increased risk of suicide, right? Because again, now they have energy to act on all these uh, thoughts of self-harm. And so TCAs are super, super dangerous and overdose. And so you had these patients who were starting to overdose on this stuff very frequently. They get physostigmine. Some people develop, you know, uh, cardiac arrest. And so because of that kind of has, has a negative um negative sort of uh, stigma to it. So a lot of people don't use it anymore. However, we will recommend it on occasion for a very clear cut sort of anticholinergic case. And you can go a little too overboard if you give too much and kind of put them into the opposite effect, right? Because this acts just like any other acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. So you've got to walk that, uh, that kind of tight rope there. Okay. Again, don't uh, memorize the dosing necessarily, but just know this is something where you have to be careful not to give it too quickly because you can end up seeing cholinergic poisoning uh, due to that. So again, you give it over several minutes um, and you're looking for things like the hypersalivation. You're looking for um, bradycardia, for seizures associated with that. So again, these are things you're just kind of monitoring for. Okay, so those are the anticholinergics. And then kind of 
what looks very similar is going to be our sympathomimetics. And so there are going to be a ton of different agents that kind of fall into this category. It's a very kind of wide umbrella here. But some of these we've already talked about. Um, and again, a lot of it kind of goes back to the receptor activity, right? So you, you wonder back in physiology, like, why is he hammering so hard on these receptors? And now hopefully in farm you've understood why. I hammered so hard on those receptors, right? Because now you have an intrinsic knowledge of what does alpha do? What does beta do, right? I'm going to assume yes, everyone does. Um, I guess Kevin's not as a, a firm in the whole class. No. Um, right, so alpha agonists, right? So you have things that just act on alpha receptors. We talked about a vasopressor that does that. You remember which one that was? Phenylephrine, right? So that's a good one uh, that acts specifically on there. And again, we use phenylephrine for cough and cold products all the time, right? So what do you think would happen if you had an alpha agonist? Yeah, vasoconstriction, which cause hypertension, right? So you expect hypertension to be a big uh, effect from that, right? Uh, how about with a beta agonist? What do you think you'd expect to see? Yeah, uh, tachycardia, right? You expect to see tachycardia, certainly some bronchodilation, which is, could be a good thing. However, uh, certainly tachycardia is going to be a big thing. So we mentioned you give too much albuterol, tachycardia is going to be one of the main side effects you see with that, right? And we've never heard of clenbuterol. Perhaps anyone uh, interested in like bodybuilding uh, um, uh, kind of realm. This is actually kind of interesting because it's a uh, beta-3 agonist. Um, beta, albuterol actually does this as well, but however, the half-life of the albuterol is very, very short. Um, but this is actually something that you could, um, pr uh, there are instructions out there, which I do not recommend you follow, but you could actually produce your own clinobuterol in the kitchen. You can actually like make it yourself in your own little home lab. And again, um, I did not do great in organic chemistry, so if I don't trust myself to do uh, at-home chemistry, I don't know if I trust any of you guys either, or anyone for that matter. But, however, uh, people would make this stuff, and they'd actually, uh, there's a couple of case reports of these, like, um, these bodybuilders who were uh, using clenbuterol that didn't, weren't able to really titrate their dose well, because they just had made it in their kitchen, um, and ended up becoming very, very tachycardic, very hypotensive, because beta-2 effects can cause hypotension. And you remember what happens when you give albuterol for potassium? Yeah, it causes it to shift intracellularly, right? We used it for hyperkalemia, if you remember back to the ER section. So this is one of those cases where their K came back and it was like two, right? And a normal K is what? At three and a half to five, right? So again, these guys are coming in you know, uh, pretty significantly hypokalemic, having all kinds of heart issues from that. Um, so again, be very careful. But clenbuterol is one you might hear about, especially in the, kind of the fitness world, you might hear about that one. Anywho, um, and then a lot of them are going to have very mixed activity because mainly they're working on increasing the amount of those catecholamines being released at any given time. So things like ephedrine, pseudoephedrine, um, certainly amphetamines. Um, anyone ever heard of PCP? There's another name for that. Angel dust is a big one. Um, it's kind of the, the precursor, uh, uh, at least um, in some ways, to a lot of like the bath salts and other kind of amphetamines we have nowadays. Um, but MAOIs, right? So before we had TCAs, we had these things like, you know, phenylzine and, and Nardil and things like that to, to treat uh, depression. So that was a big one. Um, LSD. I'm familiar with LSD. Not personally, I'm not asking that necessarily, but at least familiar with the, the concept of LSD. All right, so this is a, uh, when, when was this popular? Like 60s, 70s, right? So um, very, very uh, popular hallucinogenic at the time. Um, and then certainly things like cocaine uh, can also be a big deal. And again, depending on where you practice, you may find there's a little bit of difference in, in what you're going to see. So for instance, uh, when I did my fellowship, it was in downtown Jacksonville. Um, do, you thought, do you think we saw a lot more kind of amphetamines or more like cocaine, crack, that sort of thing? A lot more cocaine, right? So in the inner city, you find a lot more cocaine. It all goes back to what's cheaper, what's available uh, to, to people. However, if you start to, and again, you know, Jacksonville being kind of in Duval County, um, as you get, you know, farther away from the city center, you get much more rural, much more um, uh, redneck, I'll say. Um, and so what do you think you saw kind of as you got farther out from there? A lot more amphetamine. Yeah, you saw a lot more methamphetamine because people were kind of doing these clandestine labs and things like that. Um, I'm pretty sure I lived down the street. I grew up in, in Putnam County. Uh, anyone familiar with that place? You shouldn't be. Um, but I, I lived down the street from a trailer that we were pretty sure was a meth lab um, because it's very easy to, to get those kind of setups going and, and, and working out of the home. Again, I do not uh, recommend anyone uh, producing their own methamphetamine. It's very dangerous. A lot of, a lot of uh, explosions and fires associated with that. But, anyway, but again, where you work at and it will dictate kind of what you see most, most frequently, right? Um, anyway, so again, depending on which receptor activity it has will depend, will kind of inform what sort of effects you're going to expect to see. Um, so for instance, things are kind of working directly at the sympathomimetic receptors. Phenylephrine, you expect to see alpha constriction, so you expect to see a lot of hypertension. Um, some of these are going to work to kind of increase release of endogenous catecholamines. So things like, you know, cocaine work specifically at the neurons and, and the presynaptic neurons to try to increase release of things like, you know, epinephrine, norepinephrine, but also another big one is dopamine. And what is dopamine important for with these drugs? Addiction, right? Because again, they have to stimulate that reward pathway. So that's another big thing we worry about these, especially cocaine, amphetamines, etc. Um, and some of these actually work to kind of block reuptake or inhibit metabolism. That's where you see like antidepressants, uh, MAOIs can all kind of have those effects there.
So again, what you expect to see from the alpha stimulation, you see a lot of mydriasis. So again, you expect them to come in very wide kind of saucer-like pupils. Um, you're going to expect to see hypertension, they'll be diaphoretic. And in some cases, you can actually see um, uh, MIs that can be precipitated by use of some of these medications, um, not only just because you're having coronary vasospasm, but also because you're activating some platelets. Someone who's at risk um, could develop the, uh, potentially a uh, you know, an MI uh, after this. And so has anyone heard of like cocaine chest pain or crack chest pain? A lot of that goes back to some of it's vasoconstriction, but these are like kind of older um, people who have uh, some degree of uh, you know, atherosclerosis going on. And this can certainly be the thing that kind of tips them over the edge into a full-blown MI in some cases. Uh, some beta-1 stimulation, you expect to see increased inotropy and chronotropy. So certainly that can lead to what, mainly? Tachycardia, but then what could that also potentially lead into? Yeah, arrhythmia. Yeah, as you see, tachyarrhythmias could uh, potentially develop there. And then beta-2 stimulation, um, not going to be as big of a concern uh, as compared to the other two here, but certainly can see some smooth muscle relaxations. That's where you get that bronchodilation. You get uh, hypotension potentially, um, but you're also going to see hypokalemia being a potential risk there. So that's where the albuterols and clenbuterols and things like that come into play. Um, and again, depending on the agent, you may expect to see a little bit of different kind of flavor for what you're going to run into. So if someone who had potentially got too much, uh, say, IV phenylephrine due to, uh, say, in surgery, I expect them to be very hypertensive, but maybe, uh, if anything, you know, have a normal heart rate to maybe a little bit bradycardic, right? Because again, it just goes back to how the drugs are working. In a lot of cases, what you're going to find, most of them, uh, uh, the mixed agonist, things like cocaine, amphetamines, you know, um, ADHD meds, all those things are going to be kind of mixed. And so they're going to cause a lot of tachycardia, a lot of hypertension. Those are going to be the big things you're going to expect to see. So, um, and again, the differential is pretty wide. So again, anticholinergics and sympathomimetics look very, very similar to one another, which is okay. We'll talk about the treatment here in a second. Um, but a uh, very wide differential, almost identical to what you see with, um, uh, with anticholinergics. So what you might expect to see. So again, and, and what do you think sympathomimetics do to your um, uh, mental status? Should be altered uh, in which direction? So they're going to be like really sleepy and kind of passed out. They're going to be, uh, they're going to have increased activity. They're going to be uh, agitated, potentially having some hallucinations, uh, which can develop potentially into seizure, right? Seizure is always a big thing we worry about with these, uh, these toxic exposures. Uh, you worry about that kind of increased agitation, uh, elevated mental status leading into seizures. That's one of the big concerns there. So again, that looks very similar to anticholinergic. So looking at these, you can see very, very similar um, uh, things here. The one big difference you might notice some of these patients is that one, with the sympathomimetics, you expect them to have moist mucous membranes and moist skin, right? So they're going to be pretty diaphoretic because they're going to be hyperthermic. Um, you expect them to see, you know, their oral cavity be pretty moist for the most part. However, with the anticholinergic, you expect them to be, have dry mucous membranes. Um, you're also looking at things like, you know, um, uh, urinary retention. You know, they, uh, you know, if you put a Foley catheter into them, they, you know, send out two liters. Um, that's probably going to be something more related to like an anticholinergic versus the sympathomimetic. Also, the other big thing is, uh, Cocaine, amphetamine, things like that are typically going to increase um, GI motility. So again, if you were listening to their bowel sounds and it sounds very kind of hyperactive, you may think more anti uh, sympathomimetic. They sound very hypoactive. You would expect the thing anticholinergic. So these are little clues that we can do on physical exam to try to figure out what the patient might have been exposed to. And this all kind of goes back to what we do as, as consultants when we're on the phone and, and we're getting the, the report out from the provider. As far as treatment goes, um, decontamination is going to depend on the route of exposure. So one of the things is, is with, say, for instance, uh, cocaine, how do people use cocaine? Yeah, intranasal. So if, uh, cocaine itself, you typically use intranasally. So you have to think, oh, how do I decon? Say that someone comes in, they just uh, overdose on a bunch of cocaine. Again, a lot of times these patients are getting arrested and coming into us uh, for you know, medical clearance. Um, but say they have a bunch of cocaine still on their nose. What do you, what do, you do with that? And also take some for yourself. Do you like spray it with saline and try to get it off? You don't want to do that because that actually solubilizes it and the patient will thank you because you just uh, increase their absorption of cocaine. Um, but little things like that where you actually want to use something like uh, Vaseline and a Q-tip and you actually just kind of get that up there and it will help to uh, kind of eliminate further exposure to the patients. Little things like that. Um, what are some other routes? So like amphetamines, what's the main way that people will uh, uh, be exposed to amphetamines? Some, some people may smoke them, some people may snort them, but uh, a lot of times, especially like, uh, I think like ecstasy, MDMA, things like that, 
Uh, it's oral, right? So again, think about if things are in the GI tract, what can I do about that? We'll talk about decon a little bit later. Um, but think about the route of exposure. Uh, think about how you could um, help to decrease that, uh, you know, eliminate further exposure to those patients. You know, if it's in the hail, like, you know, crack cocaine or uh, they're smoking amphetamines, things like that, not a whole lot you can do about it at that point because, again, it's very kind of quick and it's absorption is kind of gone uh, just as quickly. But think about things like that. Has anyone ever heard of a body packer or a body stuffer? Well, it's a body packer. Yeah, so you think like drug mules, you think about people who are kind of coming uh, across borders and they usually have a lot of really highly well-wrapped uh, packets of drugs in their GI tract. And we'll talk about how you decon that later on. But, you know, you think about one of those packets uh, ruptures, one thing you have to think about from a source of exposure. Um, anyone, what's the difference between a body packer and a body stuffer? You know what a body stuffer is? Body stuffer is someone who, like, sees the red and blue lights and they're like, oh, crap, and they throw everything down their uh, GI tract very quickly. Um, that's usually less well-wrapped, and you're usually likely to see a lot more absorption of those drugs in those cases. But um, you know, these are things to think about. We'll talk about the decon uh, a little bit later here in just uh, on this section. But anywho, first treatment goes, you know, make some, try to put them in a calm, cool environment. Make sure you're getting good supportive care. They oftentimes will require cooling, especially for some of these designer amphetamines. They get very, very hyperthermic. I'm talking like 106, 107 degrees Fahrenheit. And so you need to do, or what are some good ways we can cool these patients down? Cold fluids, right? So you can use cold IV fluids in one way. What else? You do what called evaporative cooling, where you actually will kind of spritz down the patient with the water bottle or something, uh, and then put a fan on them. Because again, uh, when that uh, water evaporates, it'll take a lot of heat along with it. That's one way you can do it. What else? You can do ice packs, right? So little common sense things, right? So ice packs, you can put them in the axilla and the groin. They'll have to cool them down. Uh, those are kind of the main things we do. Um, uh, certain cooling blankets that are available. So there's lots of options here, but cooling them down is the biggest thing because, again, you don't want them to fry their brain with the, you know, you ever see that uh, commercials that here's your brain, here's your brain on drugs, and it's the egg. Again, I'm dating myself pretty bad, but go Google that. Uh, look that up on YouTube. Uh, anyway, you'll see that, yes, um, frying your brain is not a good idea. Basically, the point I was trying to get at. Anywho, uh, but the other big thing for management is going to be benzodiazepines, right? So this helps to deal with the agitation, helps to decrease the tachycardia, the hypertension, helps uh, kind of uh, in a broad spectrum sort of way. So benzos are great for that. Um, and in some cases, you may have to use some cardioactive medication. You may have to use things like Esmolol, which is what type of drug? Beta blocker helps to kind of decrease heart rate, and you can use something that works on the more the venous side, some of that nitroprus side, which can help to kind of um, drop the blood pressure as well. So again, you typically want to use this in combination um, uh, to help kind of get the heart rate, blood, con uh, blood pressure under control at that point. So we're going to be great to kind of help them. Um, uh, you know, benzos are pretty good to calm down, get the blood pressure, heart rate under control. Rarely do we have to go and use something like a beta blocker in a lot of cases. But anyway, um, so any questions on that so far? Okay, let's go ahead and do our 10-minute break. We'll come back and continue on. All right, any questions from the first half? Any fun talk stories you care to share? Got a bunch, huh? No. Yes. I can't hear you. Far too, you're way too far back in the back. <laughs> Yes. Okay. And you buy her a bath bomb, you know, a bath bomb yeah, yeah. called a pink bomb mm -hmm. that has sprinkles on the outside. So she eats them. Of course. <laughs> Should I be worried? She falls as a mom. <laughs> In my, yeah. So. Right, so they, they make this stuff to, like, to look super appealing to kids, like, you know, a cake bomb. Like, why would you not eat something called a cake bomb? I would assume it would inject icing into my mouth or something when I bit into it, like. That makes sense. Um, typically, stuff marketed for kids is, is like non-toxic. So, like 95% of that stuff is not going to be any kind of problem. Most of the time, what you end up seeing is like maybe a little bit of GI upset, but other than that, no, no issues, right? And it all depends on the dose, how much they get. Um, and a lot of times, I find that like kids will uh, definitely respond to how the parents are, are responding, right? So if mom uh, sees a kid eat something, she's like, oh my gosh, and totally freaks out, the kid's going to freak out too, right? But if they can, um, you know, try to keep it calm, cool, and collected, usually the kids are going to be a little bit better. Not all cases, but in some cases. But stuff like that, no problem. You know, if they eat a crayon, if they get into, um, I don't think any other normal kids stuff they get into, that's, not, most everything is not a problem, right? Detergent packets. That's another story. <laughs> so, there are some things that are... I haven't eaten those. Yeah, no one, no one should eat those. Um, 
Uh, my, my YouTube channel is really going to take off as soon as I upload my Tide Pod <laughs> challenge video. Um, right, so there are some things that are very appealing to children from like a color standpoint or they look like food or candy and things like that that are absolutely super toxic. And so that was where a lot of like the Tide Pod manufacturers got a lot of um, a lot of flack uh, because that stuff just did look so appealing. So the problem is like, you know, detergents are bad enough if you ingest them, but normally it's kind of like just a, an irritant. But again, if a kid tastes something nasty like that, what are they going to do? Typically, they spit it back out, right? However, if you have something like this nice, tightly compacted uh, pod of soap and they bite into it, they can't really get a good opportunity to spit that back out. So a lot of it ends up either um, spraying down uh, their throat or going into the respiratory tract, things like that. And that's where you see a lot of that damage because once it's there, you can't really uh, do a good job of getting rid of it, especially in the airway. Uh, so we saw a lot of issues with that where things that are, you know, look enticing to kids uh, can be definitely a big problem. But most things that are actually marketed for kids, um, not going to be an issue because they know the kids are going to put stuff in their mouth and they're going to eat them. Uh, usually it's not a big deal, right? Um, now, however, other things around the house you can get into, uh, the kids will likely get into that are a problem they may not think about. Um, what do you think about like coins? If a kid like swallows a quarter, is that a problem? Typically, uh, not unless it comes out as two dimes and a nickel. I'm just kidding. Um, just makes sense, right? Anyway, um, no, but a lot of times things like that, like they need to come in because a lot of times it cannot pass the esophagus. And so that is in cases where we do recommend they go in because they need to have an x-ray. Uh, we'll talk about radio opaque substances in a little bit. Um, they need to make sure that it passes the pylorus of, of the uh, – uh, or it goes into the stomach. If it does not, if it stays in the esophagus, and then usually have to have a GI come in, they'll do an endoscope and, and, and pull that out. Um, but a lot of times if it goes past that, it goes into the stomach, we just kind of let it go and it'll come out no problem, right? Um, but that's usually where we do localization x-rays. It's a big deal. Um, what about batteries? Depends on the battery. So like a normal like cylindrical, like, you know, AAA battery, not going to be a big problem. However, the thing we are seeing a lot of issues with are the big di uh, big diameter disc batteries, right? So you think about like, um, you know, remote controls and different things like that. Um, these big diameter disc batteries, they oftentimes will get stuck in the esophagus, right? Especially small kids. And so has anyone ever stuck their tongue in a nine volt battery? Yeah, same thing happens to your esophagus, it turns out, when you have that uh, being compacted around uh, those disc batteries. And so what you find is it will actually, it's not the, the acids leak out of the battery. The batteries are designed very well. They, they will never leak acid for the most part. Um, but however, what happens is you're conducting electricity at that point, and it will basically fry that tissue. And so we've seen even cases of, of kids having perforations within four hours uh, after exposure to that. So that's one of those things where you say, absolutely, you need to go in and get an a localization x-ray because we need to pull that out if, if necessary. If it's in the, if, you know, in the stomach, you usually just let it go at that point, right? So that's a, that's a big concern there. Uh, how about magnets? Magnets a big deal. Strong ones. Yeah, so it depends. Um, anyone ever heard of buckyballs? If anyone would like to see some buckyballs, I actually have recently brought in some stuff to uh, decorate my office. I have several of them there because my wife said, get them out of this house because they're so dangerous. Um, <laughs> Uh, basically, yeah, these are very strong rare earth magnets, but the thing is, if a kid ingests one magnet and it passes the esophagus, not a big deal, right? Uh, if a kid ingests two magnets, especially if they're separated, that becomes a big deal because especially those rare earth ones like the buckyballs, they can get um, uh, separated and then when they reattach, it could be through some intestinal tissue, right? And so at that point, you worry about that, that strong bond causing uh, perforation of that tissue. And so they've actually seen some, some big issues with that. Kids having to have like, you know, colectomies and, and things um, due to uh, this damage being done to that tissue, right? Uh, so very, very uh, bad from that standpoint. If it's like a magnet in a metal object, again, that similarly uh, could be bad. So it's usually gonna be uh, a scope for, uh, for those kids in a lot of cases. Because uh, again, if you just saw two magnets together on the x-ray, you can't tell if there's any tissue between there or not, right? So you usually have to go into the scope to find out. So it's gonna be bad, um, you know, and you think like, well, who would ever swallow a magnet? Little kids. And then um, people would try to do like fake tongue rings. And so they put them on, around their tongue and then swallow one of them and then potentially the other. Again, these kids have more, more sense than time in a lot of cases. So that's where you see these, uh, these stories come about. Uh, so those are the big things to, to worry about. But typically, kid stuff, not a problem. Uh, most of us are going to be non-toxic. Uh, how about those silica gel packets you find in like in shoe boxes and things? With the big skull and crossbones on them, are those bad? They're sand. They actually don't do anything bad, right? Um, but the thing is, if you swallow the whole packet, it is a potential choking hazard for small kids. That's why they, they put all that on there. So again, kind of uh, blowing all those uh, all those uh, thoughts you had in your mind, those uh, preconceived notions of toxicity, uh, blowing them out of the water, right? A hair dryer in shower, that one. I would recommend um, not putting your hair dryer in the shower. Um, toasters, not a good idea. Some people like to have breakfast in, in, in tub. I don't know. Um, not recommended. Right. Not my special uh, area, but however, I would not recommend.
one last question. Yeah. Um, is there a rule of thumb as to what you should induce vomiting with like Epicac or something? Yes, the rule of thumb is don't use your thumb to induce vomiting. No, uh, just never uh, induce vomiting, actually. That is, we'll talk about that in, in, in the decon just a second here. Um, but typically, uh, with especially with like little kids, like most of the stuff they're getting into, not going to be a problem. If anything, inducing vomiting can lead them to aspirate, and that can be much more of an issue, right? Especially with like, you know, lung, uh, you know, all that stomach contents, all that acid getting down to the lungs can cause more damage in the long run than anything that substance could have done in the first place. Um, so never, never, ever induce vomiting. Um, if people call it and they've already tried to do that, just have them stop doing it. You don't want them to induce vomiting. We'll talk about that in a few minutes here. Anyway, so going back to our toxidrome, any other questions? Okay, um, so going into the opioids, again, this is a very common thing we're going to see here in Florida because, again, we were kind of the, the home for the OxyContin Express for a long time. Now, what are we starting to see more of? A lot more heroin because, again, we shut down a lot of those pill mills and things, and so now heroin is a cheaper option. You're starting to find a lot more of that. And, again, what's a lot of that heroin being laced with nowadays? A lot of fentanyl, right, or fentanyl derivatives, things like carfentanil and, and sufentanil, things like that that are starting to get laced in the heroin. Very, very dangerous because remember how potent – uh, fentanyl is like, what do we dose fentanyl in? Micrograms, right? So if someone, um, and, and uh, the term, and I heard this from a, um, a narcotics officer, is that when they, they're trying to cut their product uh, to make more of it, they, they're called stepping on it. And so usually they'll lace it with uh, some of this fentanyl um, in order to kind of uh, spread out their product and kind of get more out of it, essentially. And so when they step on it, they don't... Um, uh, and again, they're not physically stepping on it, but that's the term they use. Um, but if they, you know, you get uh, mixed up and you have too much fentanyl on one end and, and not enough fentanyl on this other side, um, it can be a big problem, right? So you can see a lot of people end up dying from that. However, um, I mean, where does uh, our opioids come from? What plant? Poppy. The poppy, yeah, it comes from the poppy plant, right? So that's why, potentially, if you eat way too many poppy seed bagels, potentially you could pot positive on, on a urine drug screen. Very unlikely, and if someone says that, that's their defense, I find it highly suspicious. <laughs> However, most of the time, if you had someone that actually showed positive on a urine drug screen, because that's just a typical like ELISA sort of test, you can send them off for GC mass spec, and that will come back and tell you specifically what it is. If it's heroin or if it's um, you know uh, morphine or something like that, it will very specifically tell you what that is. Um, so again, uh, always be careful of those urine drug screens. Anywho, um, so we know uh, kind of a lot of the issues that come about from opioids already. We kind of know that, um, you know, what our typical ones are going to be, like, you know, kind of the naturally occurring ones like morphine and, and uh, codeine and, and heroin, things like that, are kind of very natural and very close to that original kind of opium uh, that comes from those plants. However, we have a lot of newer ones that are much more synthetic. So we mentioned like the fentanyl um, or buprenorphine. Where do we use buprenorphine? How do we use that one? Use a lot for opioid addiction. We we're trying to get someone off of uh, their opioids uh, again because remember, buprenorphine is a partial agonist, right? So it's good to help kind of stave off some of those withdrawals you can see from those. But tramadol is another one. Again, that got moved to a controlled substance, but you know, it could still be abused even though it's only a partial agonist. So uh, you're going to find a lot of patients who are coming into the ER who have at least been exposed to these, even though it may not be their main concern, but it could be a big issue. And again, which is the main receptor we're concerned with? Yeah, the mu receptor, which is going to where we see a lot of the analgesia, but also the euphoria, which a lot of these patients are going for. But the respiratory depression, CNS depression, that's the main thing we're, we're shooting for here. Again, there's other effects from like kappa and delta, but mu is the big one we're going to be focusing on for our purposes. So um, lots of different routes of exposure. So again, you can have things like where people are trying to uh, insufflate OxyContin. Anyone know what insufflate means? It's not like we go to like a fancy French restaurant for dessert, you get a insufflate, right? It's not that. Snorting, all right, so it's actually a snorting of medication, right? So if you were to crush something and snort it, that would be insufflation. Um, again, so some people may be insufflating their oxycotton, right, by crushing that up. Um, some people will do uh, all sorts of things with fentanyl patches, right? So you think fentanyl patches typically go where? On the skin. However, um, they can do things like they can try to roll it up and smoke it. And there have been some cases of sudden death um, based on people uh, trying to smoke a fentanyl uh, patch and then getting a huge dose of fentanyl in their system all at once and... Stop breathing immediately and go out and they're done. Um, people will sometimes try to do rectal administration of, of medications like a fentanyl patch if you roll it up backwards. Uh, they call that plugging, if you ever hear that term. So lots of different ways for people to abuse this stuff. Again, people have more time than sense in a lot of cases, so it's probably been tried at some point. So the question is, like, and you have to think about the kinetics as well. So, for instance, someone who smokes something versus ingests it uh, orally, what do you think has a faster onset? Smoking, yeah, typically always smoking is going to have a lot faster onset than some of these other routes. So um, versus like say someone did apply a fentanyl patch transdermally, when do you think you start to see those effects? It takes hours, right? Because, again, it takes time for that drug to partition across the, the epidermis and get into the systemic circulation. So think about the, the, uh, the source of exposure. Think about uh, the onset of action. And the other thing is if someone has a fentanyl patch on and you don't catch it, guess what? 
you're going to have continued exposure in all those cases. So if you had someone who was coming in and they were uh, appeared to be an opioid overdose, strip them down, look them all over to make sure they don't have any uh, other sources for exposure like a fentanyl patch, right? It's one of those big things that, that can be missed uh, pretty easily, right? And then depending on the uh, drug you're dealing with, you know, the, the duration of action is very, very different. So morphine only lasts a few hours versus something like methadone can last up to 30 hours from a half-life standpoint. Again, um, and what do you think happens to half-lives in overdose? They're only going to get longer, right? Because again, you have potential to potentially even saturate some of those enzymes. And, and if anything, um, you're going to have a lot more delayed absorption of some of these things because what does the uh, opioids do to your GI tract? Slows them down, right? So similar to the anticholinergics, you're going to find uh, GI hypomotility, hypoactive bowel sounds is going to be another thing you can notice on physical exam here. That can lead to delayed absorption as well. So especially like methadone can be a very long period of time where they're going to be uh, under the effects of these medications. So in clinical presentation, you expect from the CNS standpoint, a lot of uh, sedation, potentially some euphoria, uh, dysphoria in some cases, you know, especially with some of the other uh, kappa delta acting drugs, but mainly euphoria, respiratory depression, CNS depression is a big thing you're gonna see here. And again, uh, meiosis, if you see meiosis, that's great. Doesn't happen with a lot of these drugs, or especially patients have been doing it for a while. Um, you know, things like you know, tramadol has some norepinephrine effects. You really won't see that. I may see mydriasis, if anything. So it's good if you see it, but if it's not there, you can't rule out uh, opioid poisoning just because of that, right? Um, you mentioned the respiratory depression being a big deal. Um, you know, not really much else from a CV standpoint. Maybe some mild bradycardia hypotension, but not like you would see with um, like a barbiturate or a benzo or something like that. And then um, from the GI standpoint, decreased bowel motility is going to be a big thing. So especially if someone has a big ingestion of a ton of, um, you know, say oxycodone is all sitting there in their stomach uh, and the GI tract is slowed down, you can see some delayed absorption. So you think they look like they're getting better. Or in some cases, anyone remember what we use as the antidote for opioids? Naloxone or Narcan, right? So again, we give Narcan help to reverse all that because it's an opioid receptor antagonist. What happens to the GI tract, do you think? start to wake back up okay so then you give them the narcan wake them back up and all of a sudden they start to uh reabsorb some of that drug and now all of a sudden they resedate it could be related back to that slow absorption um so you can always listen to their gi tract and make sure uh, see if they have uh, any bowel sounds or not okay um, some of them can have some kind of mixed activities. Um, some of them can actually produce seizures in some cases, which is not something you normally think about in, in um, opioids. But things like, you know, tramadol is probably the biggest one. Um, Propoxyphene is off the market. and Meperidine, you really only use in surgery sort of instances. But tramadol is a big one you're going to see a lot of people using or abusing out there in the, in the real world. Um, so tramadol can certainly lead to seizures, especially patients with that renal dysfunction and whatnot. So one thing to watch out for there. Okay, so just be careful when you're dealing with drug screens, because again, if you had someone who, uh, and I saw a lot of this um, when we were doing the, the trauma simulation, and you have to come, someone coming in, uh, maybe it's related to an overdose specifically, or say it's a car accident, and you're doing labs on them, and you say, okay, well, instinctively, you want to order what? You want to order a UDS, you want to order a urine drug screen, okay? And so anyone know what normally comes on a urine drug screen? Right, so some typical things you're going to see, and this is the same stuff that would show up if you're doing like a typical, um, you know, job screen, right? So you know, you go to get uh, get hired as your first job as a PA, you'll probably undergo uh, a drug screen, and like the government kind of sets what typical things they'll, they'll check for. So they typically check for things like THC, they'll check for things like benzos, opioids, they'll check for uh, PCP, which again we don't really ever see PCP anymore, but amphetamines, cocaine, uh, and then anything else? I'm trying to think of. There's one other thing I can't think of off the top of my head. But anyway, so those, those are some of the big things you're going to be monitoring for. And it depends on how often uh, you use it or when's the last time you used it, whether things will be positive. Be careful with your opioid screens um, because, you know, it'll detect some things. It'll have heroin. It'll detect morphine, things like that. But synthetic stuff, it's not going to show. So like fentanyl, uh, things like methadone are not going to typically show up on a urine drug screen. So if you have a patient who comes in, they're breathing four times a minute, they're myotic pupils, and they're uh, totally comatose, and you give them naloxone and they come out of it, they wake up completely, but the urine drug screen comes back negative. Is that useful to you? No, you already know they're an opioid overdose. So again, it's one of those things where people will say, well, the UDS was negative. It can't be an opioid. That's not the case. Or just remember, there's a lot of false negatives you're going to see with that. Don't put much stock into a urine drug screen. In fact, I tell most people don't even get them. They get them anyway, but don't get them in a lot of cases. Okay, so again, treatment, ABC is going to be the biggest thing. So airway, obviously, is going to be a big deal here. Um, you know, intubate if necessary. Um, and we'll talk about GID contamination a little bit later. So we'll get back to that. Uh, however, the antidote is mainly going to be naloxone. We know there's lots of different routes you can administer that, right? Uh, so if you didn't have an IV, what could you do? Intranasal, absolutely. So intranasal is another big way we're, we uh, kind of discussed previously. But um, keep in mind, naloxone is not long acting. So again, with about 20, 30 minutes, it's going to wear off and your patient is going to resedate. 
Sometimes we'll put patients on um, uh, continuous infusions, and so sometimes they'll be on Narcan drips for, say, like a day or two. Uh, that is one way we can kind of help to titrate um, uh, the effects there and try to keep them to make sure they're breathing. Cause, is there any side effects from naloxone? Withdrawal is the biggest side effect, right? So, again, if uh, you have a you know opioid-naive uh, two-year-old who got into <clears throat> you know, grandma's oxycodone, um, and they came in, they're somnolent, they're, um, you know, give them Narcan, they're not going to have any problems with that, right, because they're not on opioids normally. However, someone who is abusing these pretty uh, chronically, if you give them too much naloxone, they're going to go into withdrawal. And what do those withdrawal effects look like, do you think? They don't develop seizures from opioids. That's one of the big differences here. We'll talk about withdrawal symptoms a little bit later, but they don't have seizures. What else? What, what, what would they have? Diarrhea, right? Because again, you're waking up their bowels all of a sudden. So a lot of diarrhea. Call it code brown. A lot of nausea, vomiting potentially. What about their mental status? So what is that going to be? Very agitated, very cranky, right? Because again, you just uh, reverse all those effects there. Um, they're going to be diaphoretic. They're going to be, um, you know, very agitated. Um, this is not a patient you want to deal with in a lot of cases. And in fact, most of your nurses are going to be pretty mad at you for for putting them into withdrawal. So typically, all we want them to do is to just be breathing, right? Because again, these patients are asleep. That's great. That's fine. As long as they can respond to, you know, physical stimuli, as long as they can um, be breathing appropriately, that's great, right? Um, and so oftentimes what it will do is we'll just give kind of tiny doses to try to titrate them up to where they actually respond to it. And what's one of the first signs you can see, like kind of early reversal? Anyone know? Yawning is a big one. Yeah, so yawning is the best thing that we like to see. Because, again, I can give them a huge dose of naloxone all at once, and all of a sudden they wake up and it's like the exorcist, right? They just start vomiting, and uh, they're very, very cranky. However, if I can just give them a little bit and just start to yawn, because what does that tell me? Their brain is responding to that CO2 they've been building up for a while, right? And that's where things like entitled capnography can be really useful. And you look at entitled CO2 to see how much they're retaining. Because, again, the issue is not necessarily their oxygen levels are dropping. It could be later on, but the big thing is they're holding on to too much uh, CO2. So when they start to yawn, that shows that their brain's kind of responding to that, and they're trying to breathe that off, right? So that's one of the big things we can look for. Um, and if they're doing that, that's totally fine. So as long as they're breathing, entitled CO2 is good. We don't have to really do much else. We can just kind of monitor them, right? But you have to keep an eye on them because once that naloxone wears off 20, 30 minutes, you have to go back and reassess them and make sure uh, they're still doing okay, right? Because, again, some of these drugs can last a long time, like methadone, maybe two or three days are on a Narcan drip potentially. So just kind of keep that in mind, um, whatever their opioid of choice happens to be. Okay. I mentioned uh, just be really careful. You don't have to memorize the dosing or anything. Just know that in some cases, you know, a typical dose of naloxone, um, you can use like, you know, say 0.4 milligrams. That'll reverse some stuff. In a lot of cases here um, in Florida, since we're doing a lot, a lot of prescription opioids, we'd have to give bigger doses because the more synthetic the drug is, the harder it is to respond to Narcan. And so in some cases, for like buprenorphine, methadone, we have to give 10 milligrams just to get them to reverse them. So again, it all depends on the type of opioid. Again, you can always give more. You really can't take back once you give it to them, right? So once they're awake and they're screaming, eventually they may re-sedate, but again, try not to get that point if you can. Okay. Uh, up next is going to be the sedative hypnotics. This looks very similar to opioids. And if you had to imagine someone's trying to harm themselves or they're abusing drugs in order to you know, get a high or things like that, um, do you think they just do one drug at a time? No, oftentimes they'll take everything they can find, right? Or they'll take multiple substances. A lot of cases you're going to have co-ingestions. And so a lot of times for opioids, where they co-ingest it with? Alcohol is a big one, right? What else? Benzos, muscle relaxants, is another big one. Sometimes they'll do they'll do uh, they'll kind of mix their their drugs. And everyone ever heard of a speedball? Right, that's where they'll do um, uh, they'll do like cocaine or amphetamines, and then they'll do opioids afterwards to kind of bring them back down. That may be kind of a mix where you're doing a stimulant plus a, a sedative, but more often than not, they're going to do things like opioids plus alcohol, opioids plus benzos or muscle relaxants, and so that kind of falls into the set of hypnotic sort of category. And so certainly benzos come in here, uh, or barbiturates, things like butalbital, which what do you use butalbital and your set for? Yeah, so if you ever see someone who shows positive on a urine drug screen for barbiturates, that was the other barbiturate. That's the thing I forgot on the UDS. Uh, barbiturates, you ever see someone positive for that? Ask them if they have migraines because they probably take fewer set, and that's usually what it is. Um, but muscle relaxants, so a lot of uh, things like cyclobenzaprine, baclofen. Anyone ever heard of carisoprolol before? Remember the brand name for that? Yeah, soma is the brain name for that one. So they call it, talk about the soma coma because it's a very, very significant CNS depression that comes about from that drug. Uh, so again, if you mix it with an opioid, more likely to see uh, respiratory depression associated with that, much more likely to need to intubate those patients. And then there's miscellaneous ones, so things like ethanol, chlorhydrate, which um, is a really old school drug we don't use too much anymore. And anyone ever heard of GHB? It's gamma hydroxybutyrate. Anyone know where it got its kind of uh, notoriety from? 
is used as a date rape drug for for a period of time. There's kind of a very profound uh, CNS depression, but it's very short acting, so they would kind of come back out of it pretty quick. Uh, so GHB is another one you may see uh, used in years past. But Typically, they're all going to be kind of functioning with that GABA receptor. They're all going to be making GABA work better to some degree. And again, it's going to depend on which one you're dealing with. Because remember, like a benzodiazepine works on the benzodiazepine receptor. It just allows GABA to, to bind more uh, more effectively at the, uh, the channel. And again, when you open up a GABA channel, what flows through? Chloride. Good. And what does that chloride do to the cell, the neuron? hyperpolarizes it, makes it more electronegative, so it's harder to have an action potential. That's why you see that sedative effect associated with it. But other things act here as well, so ethanol we mentioned, um, things like atominate, which is a, kind of classified as a neurosteroid, uh, propofol, all work at different sites here on the receptor. But just know, in general, they're all making GABA work better. And if you remember back to our muscle relaxants, those usually work, because there's GABA-A and GABA-B, you know, benzos work at GABA-A, so, you know, muscle uh, relaxants work at GABA-B. Clinically, it doesn't really matter, because they're both are doing kind of the same thing at that point. So what you might expect to see, a lot of uh, depressed mentation, nystagmus, ataxia, depending on the dose they received. Um, in the respiratory standpoint, some of these can cause respiratory depression, some of them cannot. Just kind of always assume the worst and assume that it's something you need to monitor for. Um, you know, things like benzodiazepines, you know, by itself, um, very, very safe from, from that standpoint. So they, they always say, like, you know, um, the only way you can actually die from a pure benzodiazepine overdose is if you get hit by the truck that's delivering it you know, pretty safe from a respiratory uh, depressant standpoint. However, when you start to mix stuff, that goes out the window. So if I mix benzos and al uh, alcohol, or if I mix an opioid plus alcohol and things like that, I'm much more likely to see those kind of synergistic activities there, right? Anyway, um, you know, from cardiovascular standpoint, you may see a little bit of hypotension, uh, maybe a little bit of decreased GI motility, but not nearly as much as you would see with an opioid or like an anticholinergic. Um, in addition to some of these are going to have anticholinergic properties. So things like soma, things like um, cyclobenzaprine or flexoril um, are going to have some anticholinergic activity as well. So if they look really CNS depressed and they come in there, but they're tachycardic, that could be what it's due to. Okay, so treatment, mainly going to be supportive here. You're going to find that airway management is a big thing. Um, you can fluids and potentially vasopressors if you need to. And again, what kind of vasopressors could we use if the patient was hypotensive? Going back to our ear doc. So vasopressin would be okay, but it's usually going to be like a second or third line sort of presser we're going to use. Dopamine's fine. You need higher dose dopamine because we want the alpha effects. Norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is a good one. Phenylephrine is probably like a second line sort of agent. Epinephrine could be potentially used as well. Usually dopamine or, or norepinephrine. Those are two kind of go-to drugs in most cases, right? And a lot of times, most of the time, we're recommending um, uh, norepinephrine more often than not, right? Remember that brain name was Levafed. You just call it leave them dead, but nowadays we're using it kind of first line in a lot of cases, so it's uh, much more popular now. Anyway, first antidotes go, not a lot of antidotes here. So the big thing we're going to have is flumazenil or rimazicon. This is going to be the antidote for a benzodiazepine only. So if you have someone who shows up and they have a barbiturate overdose, flumazenil is not going to do anything, right? If they show up and they have an overdose on soma or carisoprodol, this is not going to do anything for them. It only works for benzodiazepines, right? Um, now, the big problem here is, again, you can throw them into withdrawal. So if someone who's used to having all that GABA effect, if you reverse that all of a sudden, you got to worry about the – because remember, what's the opposite of GABA? Yeah, glutamate, right? Glutamate was very excitatory. Um, so if you get rid of all the GABA activity, guess what? Glutamate is still there. It's going to cause a lot more uh, excitotoxicity. You're going to see seizures develop. So um, opioid overdose, not potential, or opioid withdrawal, not fatal. Benzo withdrawal, absolutely can be fatal, right? Because again, you worry about the seizures developing there. And then uh, no good ways to kind of in increase the elimination of these drugs. As I mentioned, usually you got to give the liver time to metabolize stuff. However, if you had like a phenobarb overdose, you could do what we call urinary alkalinization. We'll talk about that at a, at a later time. But uh, that's where we actually give sodium bicarb to try to increase the pH of the urine and actually helps to eliminate it more quickly. So we'll talk about that in a different section. So as I mentioned, withdrawal, um, you know, opioid instead of hypnotic withdrawals, they withdrawal look very similar to one another. They get very uh, agitated, a lot of anxiety, very irritable, uh, a lot of GI hyperactivity. The big difference here, though, is that instead of hypnotics, we'll have withdrawal seizures. So if you imagine like a chronic alcoholic who, you know, normally lives at a level, and, and anyone know what the legal limit for uh, alcohol is, for, like driving and things? Hmm? Yeah, 0 0.08 or 80 milligrams per deciliter uh, is the way I normally talk about it. Some people live at like two, three, four hundred uh, on a normal basis. If you take it that away, they start to withdraw from that. You got to worry about seizures, right? Um, you know, I'm usually at like a level like 100 usually for most days, um, but not so bad. But they can get much higher than that. I'm just kidding. That goes to show you tolerance is a big deal. You can have people who are at a, live at a level 200 and they're talking to you like I am to you right now, right? So it, it's one of those things where um, there's a lot of tolerance that goes into these medications. So if you withdraw from that, 
you're kind of disrupting their homeostasis and those seizures can be pretty nasty to treat. Because again, if I had a withdrawal seizure due to say like a benzo withdrawal, how do I treat that? I got to give more benzos, right? So that's the only thing I can really use to treat that. So imagine if I give someone a flamazenil, which is a benzodiazepine receptor antagonist, and then all of a sudden I uh, they start to have seizures, what do I treat them with? Now I got to give them even more benzos than what they probably overdosed on in the first place just to stop their, their seizures, right? So it's kind of a dangerous um, game you're playing with that. So, um, you know, Narcan, I can give that with impunity. I give it to anyone. Not going to be a big problem. Uh, flamazenil, much less likely to see a lot of people give that. You need to be very judicious in, in its uh, application. Okay. All right, so coming up, uh, next is going to be patient assessment. So say, for instance, you had someone uh, who had a poison exposure uh, or something you think might be potentially toxic. What are some of the, like, the things you want to know about the patient? What are some questions you want to ask them? How long ago? Okay, so time frame. Good. So how long ago did this happen? Well, it's how much? How much? So uh, the dose or the amount ingested can be very important to know if you can get that information. So say, for instance, like, you know, mom says, oh, my, my little kid got into, uh, you know, little Johnny got into, uh, he, he had a mouthful of his ibuprofen. How much do you think that is? A mouthful. Like, usually for kids, you kind of estimate this would be about five mLs or teaspoon roughly. Okay. So say, oh, we got about three swallows. You know, like three times five, maybe 15 mLs. Okay. For an adult patient, what might you think? Again, Depends on the uh, adult mouth, how big it is, but uh, normally about 15 mLs or so. That's kind of our, our, our rough rule of thumb we use for that. So little kids, one mouthful, about 5 mLs. For an adult, usually about 15 mLs or so. Um, and again, you think like, you know, some of these substances, they taste so nasty. You're like, well, how'd you get more than one mouthful in? But some of the things, like you just, you know, you try to, you know, something uh, stored in a, in a normal cup. You may not think about like bleach or something like that. You're like, you can get a couple of swallows in before you actually notice kind of what's going on and, and you kind of start to spit it out. So again, it, it's possible. Um, okay, so we want to know how much. What else do you want to know? The time frame is that how much? Yeah, that's all the information we need. We're good to manage this patient now. Are you wanting other medications? Good. Other medications? Good. So you want to have their kind of full history. So along with that, you want to know allergies. allergies. Co past medical history. That's always going to be useful to know. So comorbid conditions. What else about the actual exposure? Hmm. Yeah, the route. Yeah, so okay. So especially with like some of these intentional injections, it could be different routes. Um, you know, is it an inhalational exposure? Is it a oral exposure? Things like that. Good to know. Last meal. Yeah, that's about last meal, certainly. Um, so other things you want to know. So things think about things like um, what is the actual product that they ingested, right? So again, it's very important to have the specific products. So you hear Clorox, you think what? You think bleach, right? But there's a lot of Clorox products out there. They like to put their name on all sorts of things. If I hear Nyquil, what do you think? cough and cold stuff but like what's a nyquil tylenol there's uh, antihistamines there could be decongestants depending on the type of nyquil you get you know so again there's lots of different things that are out there uh, that can have the same brand name on there because again it's you know beneficial to them put their name on stuff brain recognition and whatnot but we need to know specifically what they got into so what can you recommend say you're on the phone with somebody and say hey i'm coming to your er what do you recommend to them they can bring it in or just take a picture of it. Right? Everyone's got a camera phone nowadays. Um, so you can take a picture of it and that way you at least have an idea of what you specifically you're dealing with. We have a big index we use at the poison center. It's called Poison Dex. Or basically we can go through and put in the actual product and figure out specifically what's in it, right? Because, again, knowing what type of product it is will indicate things like what the actual substance was they were exposed to and also like things like concentration, right? So, again, looking at bleach, typical bleach you can get in, you know, over, you know, uh, you know, over the Publix or Walmart or whatever. It's typically like 3% bleach, right? Not a big problem if you only get a mouthful of it. However, we live in Orlando. It's a big travel hub. Lots of people work at these hotels. What kind of bleach do you think they use? They use a lot bigger concentrations, right? Because, again, they have to go through. I mean, I don't know if you've seen some of these hotel rooms, but they need a lot of bleach sometimes. They get they stain. <laughs> If they're even clean them at all, I guess. But um, anyway, these pretty concentrated bleeds. So, you know, someone's mom works at the hotel. And they're like, hey, this stuff works really great at work. Let me try it at home. Take some home. All of a sudden, kid could be exposed to a lot higher concentration. You know, think about things like hydrogen peroxide. You know, hydrogen peroxide, um, usually not a big deal if you get a small amount. Because uh, what does hydrogen peroxide normally turn into? Water and? Oxygen, right? So again, if you swallow that, that's why you see a lot of belching. You see a lot of burping associated with hydrogen peroxide. That's actually what they recommend giving to animals to cause them to, to induce emesis. Um, but you know, normal three percent hydrogen peroxide you get, you know, uh, at the first aid section in CVS, not a big deal if you get a little bit of that. However, I've had one case where it was a health food store uh, where they were trying to do these hydrogen peroxide cleanses, and you were meant to dilute this product out, but it was ninety-nine percent hydrogen peroxide. 
all that air, when it starts to develop in the stomach, guess what? It's not just staying in the stomach, it likes to partition out. It'll go into the bloodstream. Now you can have air emboli uh, developing in, in the brain. You have uh, people stroking out because of that. So lots of different things you have to think about um, because, again, the dose matters so, so much here. Concentration, dose matters a huge amount. Okay, anything else you want to know? So think about things like, okay, um, you know, mom calls up and, and kid says, hey, uh, my, my kid just drank up uh, uh, an entire bottle of Tylenol. You're like, well, how did the kid drink a whole bottle of Tylenol, right? The question is, like, did they actually do that or is there something else going on? So you have to ask questions to the mom. You have to kind of prompt them because usually they're freaked out. They're worried. Uh, you have to think about things like, well, okay, well, how full was the bottle when it started? You know, was it a full bottle? Was it half empty? Because that changes your dose pretty significantly because oftentimes we go off of worst case scenarios. And so if we get a better idea of how much was there to begin with, that can help us out because we do a lot of calculations to see if, you know, certain drugs are going to be a problem or not. Um, think about things like, you know, I guess, okay, well, you, know, you say they drank the whole bottle. Is there anything spilled on the floor? Oh, yeah, there's a bunch on the floor already. Okay, well, that could lead you to think, okay, well, maybe less of it was ingested than what was originally kind of uh, said to you. So these are kind of probing questions you have to ask to try to figure out, okay, well, what's actually going on here? What's actually do I need to be worried about in these cases? Um, right. And plus, you know, kids' medications now taste a lot better than they used to. I don't know if, did you guys like taking your medications as children? Right now they have like orange-flavored ibuprofen and grape-flavored Tylenol, so it's not uncommon for people to ingest entire, or kids to get an entire bottle, you know, uh, no problem. Um, you know, I can't tell how many calls I've had of kids ingesting like 200 gummy vitamins. The parents are freaked out, and they're like, they ate all these gummy vitamins. I'm like, well, they, they kind of made them that way to, you know, make them enticing. Um, and, yeah, usually they have a bunch of diarrhea from, from all that. But um, anyone ever had the sugar-free gummy bears? Don't do it. Just read the Amazon reviews and you'll get a sense for uh, why you should not do that. It's no good. Not that I've ever participated in a challenge to do that, but it's, it's no good. Anyway. Okay, so looking at things like vital sign changes. Do you have a patient present to you? You know, and a lot of times history is not going to be uh, uh, available to you. The patient is obtunded and they can't talk to you or they're lying to you or they don't have any family members around, things like that. Um, always, you know, especially in the ER setting, talk to EMS. Try to get in any sense for what was going on at the scene um, before they leave. Because, again, usually they're busy. They want to get out of there. Um, but get a sense for, like, okay, well, is there anything around them? Were there pill bottles on the floor? Were there, um, you know, any, anything like that? Any paraphernalia with the needles? Anything like that to try to give you an idea of what's going on. Now, if their patient is bradycardia, like what are some things you think can cause bradycardia? Normal medication. Like these are people that take medications just like everyone else. Beta blockers, right? What about calcium channel blockers, right? So verapamilogotiazin. These are things you want to think in your differential that could be causing bradycardia. We talked about this from a toxidrome standpoint. Cholinergics can cause uh, bradycardia there, right? On the flip side, lots of things cause tachycardias. You want to think about sympathomimetics, think about things like anticholinergics, uh, even things you might not think about causing tachycardia, things like salicylates, iron ingestion. Just know there's always a wide differential, and these are things you're going to be working through to kind of figure out, okay, well, patient presenting this way, it could be these three or four things, and then at that point, you can start to rule things out, right? Um, so you can do things like, okay, well, if it's an iron ingestion, what could I do to see if it was really iron or not? Is there any lab tests I could do? Put a big magnet to the patient, see if they lift up. <laughs> and then like an MRI and see if they go anywhere. No, but I can do I can do iron levels, right? So you just like you check an iron level for an anemic patient, I can check iron levels for someone who potentially overdosed on it and figure out if their level's high, right? So these are things I can do. And once I have a, a suspicion, you know, for different substances, then I can sort of rule things out based on uh, on on drug levels and, and things like that. Um, hypotension, you want to think a lot about your antihypertensive drugs, certainly. So things like, you know, uh, ACE inhibitors, um, you know, diuretics, you want to think about calcium channel blockers, mainly the dihydropyridines, uh, beta blockers, these are all things you consider. And then from a hypertension standpoint, think about uh, stimulants typically. So either, um, you know, amphetamines, you know, if they're, uh, you know, say for instance, they come in, they're tachycardic, they're hypertensive, and they have ADHD, what might you think? Maybe they did their Adderall or Concerta or something like that, one of their amphetamine-based medications there, right? Um, you know, think about thyroid supplements. If so someone that was overdoing their thyroid supplement and they had thyrotoxicosis, so that's potential there. So lots of different things you need to consider here. And again, you're not ruling out the medical stuff just because you think it's a drug overdose. You want to make sure you're kind of considering everything at that point. Uh, some things can cause hypothermia, and, and typically you don't think of hypothermia being a big issue here in Florida, but it certainly can happen occasionally. I uh, think the like carbon monoxide exposure uh, where do you think you might find carbon monoxide exposure? Yeah, uh, so potentially fires, definitely. Cars left running in the garage usually is a kind of a common one. Or if they have like a hose, like uh, if they're trying to harm themselves, a hose kind of um, taped up from the uh, exhaust into the car. Generators are huge in Florida, right? Because again, during the summertime, guess what's happening? 
hurricanes, you all lose power. Use your generators. A lot of people don't want their generators getting stolen, so they'll try to run them in the garage or they'll run them close to the house. Not good because that carbon monoxide can be a big source for exposure, right? Um, but certain opioids, hypoglycemics. So going back to our, our endo stuff and talking about um, you know, sulfonylureas and insulin, things like that. And then hyperthermia, you want to think some pathomimetics, you want to think anticholinergics. Again, just kind of give you an idea of different things that should be under differential if you're starting to see some of these signs and symptoms. So again, once I can start to link several of these things together, I get a better picture of, okay, well, I think it could be anticholinergic. I think it could be an opioid. I think it could be this, this, or that. <clears throat> Uh, they highlight things like bradypnea. Think about opioids. Even clonidine can do this in, in overdoses. Like clonidine actually looks a lot like opioids in some cases. Uh, they had tachypnea. So we're thinking about things like salicylates, like aspirin. Aspirin actually directly stimulates your, your respiratory drive. We'll talk about that uh, probably over in the CMS section. Um, think about cyanide, right? Where do you think you see cyanide exposures? Besides like that, uh, uh, maybe you have like a, uh, your spy and you have like a tooth, a molar installed that you can do it, crack into. And then you can have... Uh, Sorry, I was thinking of your, your dental flight. I apologize. Um, but anyway, yeah, so you, know, you think about that. But where, what more, more commonly would you see a cyanide exposure? House fires. House fires are a big one, right? As you start to burn plastics and, and synthetic fibers, that can produce cyanide. So that's actually a big one uh, that we worry about. So if you ever have someone who's exposed to gases in, in a structural fire, think carbon monoxide, think cyanide, in addition to a lot of other um, uh, irritant gases. But those are the big things you, you think about there. So anyway, so again, Keep the differential open, start to rule things out based on, you know, if I had a patient who was tachypnic, uh, but they did not have a history coming from a house fire, you know, thinking less likely to be cyanide. I'm thinking maybe it's, it could be salicylates. And again, can I do an aspirin level? Absolutely. So I can do an aspirin level, figure out if that's going to be it or not, right? Things that are causing meiosis, think cholinergics, think uh, opioids, clonidine, thermidriatic, think stimulants like anticholinergics or antidepressants uh, can commonly cause that. Again, don't rule anything in or out based on just the pupils alone, but it could be kind of useful to kind of add on to the pile of things you're, you're considering here. Uh, the diaphoretic, you think about like some pathomimetics, a lot of stimulants and things like that. Organophosphates, you think about because, again, it's causing a lot of secretions and whatnot. Um, let's see, dry mucous membranes, oftentimes we'll think anticholinergics there. Um, flush skin, you know. Uh, anyone know where you see boric acid at? Eye wash. Hmm? Yeah, so you have some eye wash that has some boric acid in it. Uh, borax was a popular cleaner used uh, you know, decades ago, uh, but oftentimes uh, they would clean baby bottles out with that and then. Um, not clean out appropriately, and the baby would get some exposure to boric acid and cause this kind of red lobster um, sort of uh, appearance to the baby. It got very flush and, and, uh, um, and red. Um, even like bullet can form if you have patients who are down for a long period of time. So this, you see this a lot with lysine depressants, like barbiturates, carbon monoxide. You can actually have this form that could be, you know, give you another clue of what's going on. Okay, so uh, one thing here, so seizure-inducing medications or seizure-inducing seizure agents, these are good things to consider. Uh, if you have a patient who shows up with a seizure who had maybe no previous history of it, um, you know, because again, if you had like, say, a normal adult, no past medical history, and all of a sudden they just developed a seizure all, all of a sudden, like, you know, your differential is, it should be pretty wide, right? It's unlikely someone would develop a seizure disorder that late. It could be, um, but you, know, you typically think of drugs and things like that. Or if you had the history that, hey, they're coming from, um, I don't know if there's any like big like rave uh, events happening, in, uh, happens in Orlando, but say they're coming to like Miami Dade or something uh, and, and they have a new seizure, new onset seizure, do you think medications, right? We have a mnemonic because we like mnemonics and talks. It's called Otis Campbell. And uh, I'm not going to have you memorize this specifically, but just know there's a very wide differential for what's going to be in your uh, seizure-inducing agent. So certainly our phosphates, our TCAs, um, isoniazid. Do you remember where we saw use of this? TB, right? So use it for TB. How about insulin? Why do you, why do you think that would cause a seizure? Hypoglycemia. Yeah. So again, hypoglycemic seizures, we've seen that. Uh, sympathomimetic, so cocaine, amphetamines, anything that falls under that sympathomimetic can definitely cause seizures. Um, camphor, anyone know where you saw camphor used to be used? Used to be some mothballs, so you don't see that anymore because of that seizure problem. You saw that kids getting into mothballs. Um, but then you have aspirin, amphetamines can do this. Uh, methyl xanthines, remember what falls into that category? Uh, caffeine and theophylline. Yeah, caffeine, theophylline are your methyl xanthines. Sometimes we have to kind of fudge the mnemonics a little bit to try to help us uh, to fit things in there. Uh, PCP we mentioned, which you don't see too much anymore. Uh, but then the withdrawal uh, aspects are important to consider here. So like benzodiazepine withdrawal, ethanol withdrawal, and then lithium, certainly a big dose can do that, especially like renal dysfunction, and then lidocaine as well. So again, very wide differential. If you see new onset seizure, lots of drugs can cause this, but it's important to rule out the big things. So for instance, they come in with a seizure, make sure they're oxygenated, make sure they have glucose, uh, and then you can sort of go through and see if it's one of these other substances here. Uh, if you have certain odors, and uh, 
Could you guys guess how many uh, diagnoses I've made just off of an odor of a patient? Yeah, zero. Um, usually these patients are not great smelling to begin with. Um, not saying anything about their personal hygiene. I'm just saying they often do not have uh, pleasant odors. However, there are certain things that could clue you in to certain um, uh, toxins. So, for instance, you know, uh, bitter almonds can smell like cyanide. There's actually kind of a genetic um, uh, sort of link. So, again, some people can't even smell bitter almonds. Uh, so that would not be a good one to use for some patients. Um, but things like, you know, garlic can smell like arsenic which again, arsenic they used to poison like spaghetti sauce and stuff because that way you can kind of mask the smell a little bit with that. Um, uh, pears might smell like chloral hydrate, you know, a methyl salicylate this is, a, this is probably one you've probably encountered at some point, but like wintergreen, that kind of wintergreen smell is related back to methyl salicylate. Um, and then anything with sulfur in it is going to smell like rotten eggs. So remember we talked about uh, N-acetylcysteine for CF as a mucolytic, that one smells a lot like rotten eggs because of the, the sulfur content. Uh, this is a good mnemonic to remember uh, for your purposes and just in general clinical life, um, but the mud piles. You guys have heard this before? This is a reason for wide anion gap acidosis, so um, M in your methanol. Where do you find that? That is, I find in windshield washer fluid. Uh, or potentially if you had someone, and again, we would see this occasionally, especially like in southern Georgia and like Duval County-ish, um, people are trying to run their own stills to, uh, to produce whiskey and things like that. Um, actually, when you're distilling uh, uh, liquor, one of the first alcohols that comes off is methanol. So if you don't get rid of that first, uh, they can potentially go blind and have all kinds of issues. So again, don't make your own alcohol. Just uh, go buy it from somewhere. I guess you can make your own beer and stuff. It's not really a big problem or, or wine, but the, the distilling uh, liquors is, is more problematic. Um, certainly uremia. Diabetic ketoacidosis, uh, peraldehyde. Anyone ever find peraldehyde? I don't either. We don't ever use it anymore. But we keep it in the mnemonic because it helps it to fit. Um, isoniazid and iron, lactic acidosis. Uh, where do you find ethylene glycol? Antifreeze. Yeah, antifreeze, radiator fluid uh, is where you more, more commonly find that. Uh, Silicates, we mentioned aspirin. And then um, I, I like to do the cat mud piles because it helps me to kind of widen out the difference a little bit further. So we have things like cyanide, carbon monoxide can cause this. Um, alcoholic ketoacidosis. You find sometimes find that with the kind of chronic alcoholics. And then toluene. Anyone know where you find toluene? Using paint thinners, like paint strippers, you find toluene. So I had, I had one patient who um, was a frequent flyer of ours who would like to, uh, he's, a, he's a homeless gentleman, but he would go into like Walmarts and things like that, go back to the hardware section, usually in the back of the store, and just huff paint thinner there for a while until he got caught and kicked out, and then he had to come to see us. So um, again, different strokes for different folks, I guess. <laughs> And then um, I'll just finish out this section real quick and I'll be done. Um, but radio opaque agents. So sometimes you can actually get x-rays to find if someone has uh, ingested a substance. And so we use a, a mnemonic here called CHIPES. Again, clinically, I don't like to um, rely on these x-rays uh, if I can. Because again, if I don't see something, I can't rule out an ingestion necessarily. So again, it could be just based on um, the amount of substance that's there. It could be on um, positioning, things like that. Because we've we've missed iron injections before where um, we didn't see an x-ray. Uh, the doc sent them home and then they came back in and kind of fulminate um, uh, metabolic acidosis and, and nearly died. Um, but don't rely on these. If it's there, it's great because you can you know say, okay, yes, absolutely it's there. But um, other cases, don't don't rely on that. Um, but certain, uh, things like chloral hydrate, uh, heavy metals. So again, any type of metal. So if you have like a bullet ingestion, some uh, seems like cases where autistic kids were swallowing bullets. Uh, you can see that there, which is actually a good source for what type of heavy metal exposure. Lead, yeah, so you actually have lead levels uh, being drawn to these patients due to uh, the acid kind of leaching off some of that lead there. Um, iron, phenothiazines, which are kind of our antipsychotics, enteric coated products, so like long acting extended release products, and then uh, salts. Uh, potentially there's so like potassium salts or lithium you can see some cases we'll do this for like body packers or body stuffers if they have like a really large amount you may be able to start to see that um throughout the the gi track but again if it's negative don't rely on that but if it's there it's nice to kind of um one more thing to kind of uh, solidify the diagnosis okay any questions before i let you guys go so that's it kind of on the basic assessment. Uh, I talked about the main toxidromes. Now we're going to move into some decontamination, and then we'll get into um, uh, specific substances there. And then also we'll talk a lot about um, uh, things you're going to see here in Florida you might not see elsewhere. So we talk a lot about envenomations, um, uh, both of the marine and terrestrial variety. So no question? All right, I'll see you guys tomorrow then.